Alors, bonjour à tout le monde. Je crois que c'est 10h30. Nous allons pouvoir commencer euh, à l'heure cette conférence. Alors, peut-être pour commencer, euh, vous dire qu'il y a de l'interprétation. Donc, vous avez les, les boutons pour euh, le, le volume et aussi pour euh, les numéros. Alors, nous avons un, en, le français, two, English, uh, tres, Castellano, et voilà. <rire> so, J'espère que tout le monde peut trouver son interprétation. Et merci aux interprètes euh, bénévoles qui, euh, qui ont accepté. Donc, euh, qui a, alors, quand on appuie sur euh, le micro, si vous appuyez sur le petit bouton micro, vous me coupez la parole. Donc je vais euh, garder mon micro pour, euh, donc, euh, pour faire euh, un petit peu l'accueil dans, dans ce lieu. Donc vous êtes ici au Comité économique et social européen qui rassemble la société civile organisée d'Europe. Euh, donc je suis personnellement Geneviève Savigny, euh, paysanne dans le sud de la France, membre de la Confédération paysanne et de Via Campesina, et euh, membre du comité économique et social euh, avec ma délégation française. Euh, donc je, je vais... Alors d'abord, je vais déjà commencer par m'excuser, je vais vous accueillir, mais après je devrais partir pour d'autres euh, réunions pour d'autres euh, travaux. Euh, donc la, la question de, de la déclaration des droits des paysans et des droits aux semences euh, a, a déjà été un petit peu euh, étudiée dans notre, euh, dans notre institution, puisque nous avions en, deux, en 2017, euh, il y a eu des débats dans le cadre de la section NAT, qui s'occupe de nature, d'environnement et d'agriculture, et pour euh, présenter cette déclaration, qui était à l'époque en discussion au Conseil des droits de l'homme à Genève. Et après une discussion approfondie, la section NAT avait apporté son soutien à cette déclaration et avait fait une résolution pour que les, les chefs d'État européens soutiennent, soutiennent ce projet. En, au final, en 2018, la déclaration a été adoptée par l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies avec une très large majorité. Alors malheureusement, les, les États européens, euh, à part le Portugal et le Luxembourg, se sont abstenus, en, en gros, hein, peut-être. Mais euh, cette déclaration, donc, euh, la déclaration des droits des paysans et autres travailleurs en zone rurale a été adoptée aux Nations unies. Alors c'est très important pour euh, tous les paysans de, de la planète, et y compris en Europe, puisque ça rassemble dans un document qui fait euh, environ 16 pages, l'ensemble des droits qui permet à un paysan, c'est-à-dire un petit producteur d'aliments, et les travailleurs qui vivent de la terre et de l'accès aux ressources, de, ça, ça permet dans ces droits euh, d'avoir un peu une sécurité euh, sur, euh, sur son activité. Donc il y a tous les droits, euh, je dirais un petit peu les droits universels, le droit euh, à la vie, à l'éducation, euh, le droit euh, au logement, etc. Mais mis dans, mis dans un contexte paysan, un contexte rural. Il y a également des articles plus spécifiques qui euh, précisent des droits qui, qui existent en fait dans de nombreux instruments mais de façon euh, plus diffuse et qui précisent le droit à la terre, le droit à la biodiversité et le droit aux semences. Euh, article 17 je crois et je dis ça sous contrôle de mes collègues qui connaissent parfaitement la déclaration. Donc c'est euh, cet article peut-être qui va euh, guider un peu les, les travaux d'aujourd'hui. Et euh, voilà, c'était un petit peu cette introduction au document. J'ai vu qu'il y a le, le texte de la déclaration. Et je, je, je vous souhaite de très bons travaux autour de cette question donc, des brevets et en relation à la, aux droits des paysans. Et je, je vais vous souhaiter une très bonne journée, enfin une très bonne matinée, et, euh, et vous quitter sans plus, de, sans plus attendre. Bonne journée. Merci Geneviève. Eh, voy a hablar en español, en realidad. <ríe> Gracias, Genevieve. <ríe> Yo soy Alessandra Turco, soy miembro del, um, de CBC, de la Coordinación Europea Vía Campesina, y que es un conjunto de organizaciones de campesinos, campesinas, trabajadores y trabajadoras de la tierra. Entonces, para nosotros, como ya uh, Genevieve estaba diciendo, la declaración ha sido un uh, logro uh, muy importante porque uh, nos permite uh, de tener en palabras claras 
los que son las necesidades y los derechos de los campesinos, de las campesinas y de los trabajadores de la tierra. Entonces, lo que tenemos que hacer ahora es buscar los instrumentos para que esta declaración se pueda poner en práctica y entonces ver en el, en el específico en cuáles artículos la, la, este um, conjunto de, 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 de expresión de derecho nos va a permitir de tener un acceso a una vida digna para todos los que trabajan en el campo y viven en el medio rural. Entonces, en este conjunto, seguro que la posibilidad de acceder a los recursos, y en eso en específico a la tierra, al agua y a las semillas, y más en general a todos los recursos fitogenéticos, entonces es algo de llave para permitir el desarrollo de nuestra vida, de nuestra capacidad de producción y para nos permitir de alimentar la población europea. Esto en el marco de la, vía, de la Coordinación Europea de la Vía Campesina, nosotros pensamos que es muy importante lograr desarrollar un sistema de agricultura local, un sistema de agricultura hacia la soberanía alimentaria. Ese sistema solo será posible de ponerlo en marcha por medio de una cuanta práctica agroecológica que sean que tengan un eje de agricultura sostenible y que nos permita de desarrollar nuestra capacidad de producción y de alimentación en, 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 en armonía con el medio ambiente. En este cuadro, el, el acceso a las semillas también se convierte en una cuestión de derecho, entonces en una cuestión de derecho respecto a los que son también los derechos colectivos y de las comunidades. Y entonces el derecho a la producción, al uso, a la, a la conservación y a la venta de estas semillas para que nos podamos tener un sistema de semillas autónomas que nos pueda permitir de producir esta comida. En uh, todo este uh, en todo ese sistema, los que Uh, va a um, conjugar uh, los diferentes defensas de nuestros derechos, no solo es la declaración del derecho campesino, sino también es el artículo 9 del Tratado sobre los Recursos Fitogenéticos. Y entonces ahí también se hace referencia a nuestros derechos y a los derechos de la población autóctona, de la población de donde se desarrollan la, las semillas originarias, eh, para ver en qué forma y en qué modo tenemos derecho al uso, tenemos derecho al respeto y tenemos derecho a la repartición de los beneficios. Entonces, en todo ese sistema, a nivel sea eh, europeo, sea eh, a nivel global y luego nacional, nuestro sistema de producción, reproducción y venta e intercambio está amenazado por las políticas que vamos poniendo en marcha. En el marco de la, del Pacto Verde Europeo y de las políticas de sostenibilidad que la Unión Europea eh, va poniendo en marcha, esperamos de no estar demasiado amenazado eh, también en relación a los que son los acuerdos comerciales y en específico los acuerdos comerciales con los Estados Unidos, Canadá y Japón. Entonces, ahí también... Uh, tenemos el, uh, el riesgo de una contaminación de nuestra propia semilla y de nuestra capacidad de producción. Uh, respecto a eso, entonces, voy a ser breve para dejar más tiempo al, uh, al debate. Uh, la idea de hoy es uh, un poco de ver a nivel de académico, de expertos, de campesinos y de los representantes de las instituciones europeas, entonces, ¿cuáles son los elementos más uh, importantes sobre los cuales tenemos que trabajar en conjunto para uh, poder detectar un poco cuál puede ser el impacto de las patentes a nivel europeo y también uh, una reflexión que ya se abrió uh, hace tiempo y que también la Comisión Europea está impulsando 
sobre el, uh, las, uh, lo, los nuevos, uh, los NBT uh, o NGT, entonces los nuevos, uh, um, uh, <ríe> los transgénicos de nueva, uh, bueno, excusa, <ríe> que nosotros, eh, lo, lo, las nuevas tecnologías de, de, de reproducción y gen genómica. Eh, respecto a eso, yo dejaría la palabra directamente a Fulia para que pueda un poco coordinar esta mesa redonda. Muchas gracias. Uh, good morning again, uh, everyone. I'm going to speak in English. Uh, my name is Fulia, and I'm your moderator for today. So we have a packed schedule. We have a panel with uh, four, five speakers, four presentations. And then uh, the Commission services, three services of the Commission will be able to react on the presentations and then we'll open the floor to your questions and uh, more general discussion on the topic. So uh, the panel uh, offers different perspectives on uh, the impact, so in the context of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Ru People Living in Rural Areas, you have different perspectives. First, we're going to hear about the patenting of genetic information, general, and then the different uh, market and other effects of such patents, so in agricultural systems. And then we'll hear about the peasant himself, about what all of this means in their practical realities. So without further ado, uh, I'm giving the floor to Jean-Luc Gall, a senior legal officer at the European Patent Office in Munich. Um, and his aim in his LinkedIn account, I checked, is to clarify the practice of the European Patent Office in plant-related inventions. So he's, you know, the man of the hour to be here. Um, and uh, he has 15 minutes to explain to us the status of the discussions in Munich. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fulia. Uh, I understand that, so I have to stick to the 15 minutes so I will not lose some time, precious time. No, yes, I start losing. That's the direction, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's the direction. Okay, so my, my presentation will be divided in three parts. Uh, the first uh, minutes will be dedicated to presentation because you are not necessarily familiar with the, the environment of the European Patent Organization, so a few words on that. I will then pursue with the, 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 the last developments uh, in the field of uh, the product obtained by essentially biological processes, probably heard about uh, the different uh, well-known cases like tomatoes, uh, broccoli, peppers, so a lot of different vegetables which are under the spotlight. And I will conclude the presentation with a few words with the cooperation with the Committee Plan Variety Office because, of course, it's key that a uh, flow of information could be exchanged between the two organizations to avoid that some patent could be granted uh, for uh, varieties which has been already protected and vice versa. So, no, yes. Uh, so, just a few words about the mission of the, the European Patent Office. So, you can, need, you can read that it's really to support innovation. And, of course, the main task is to grant some, some patents uh, which will uh, uh, have effect uh, in most of the country in Europe. So, the EU, but even beyond the EU, since a country like Switzerland, Turkey or Norway uh, are also covered uh, by uh, this um, convention. And what is also important to keep in mind is that the European Patent Organization is the second largest inter intergovernmental institution in Europe. Of course, you know who, we, who is the first one. It's the European Commission. So uh, uh, 7,000 uh, employees at the European Patent Organization, uh, so quite important one. Uh, the European Patent Organization itself is divided into branches. The first one, which is the Administrative Council, which is composed by representative of the, the member states, so 38 member states, all the EU member states plus uh, 10 uh, and 11 now uh, additional uh, members, uh, mostly to discuss uh, and to adopt the, the modification uh, of the law, but also to adopt the budget and to support the President in his task. 
the European Patent Office uh, to, to which I belong to, uh, so the, 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 you can read that it's really the mission is to grant and to, uh, uh, to deliver or to, or to refuse patent application, but at least to assess the, the, the merits of the different application and to intervene into the opposition proceedings, which clearly uh, is the, 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 the phase after the granting of the patent. They are always uh, in the, the frame of the EPO, the possibility to challenge patent which have been granted by anyone, by the way. There is no uh, legi legitimate interest to, uh, to, to put forward. And what is quite important is that when there is a decision, for instance, of the opposition division, it's still possible to challenge before the Board of Appeal which, uh, legally speaking, belongs to the European Patent Office, but what is really important to keep in mind, they are totally independent in their task. And you will get uh, several illustrations uh, in the, 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 the rest of my presentation. So just uh, uh, an overview of the, the, the patent application, the volume in 2018, you can see a steady increase. Um, more than 150,000 applications, and now we are even uh, close to uh, 180,000. Uh, when reverting to the plant sector, you can see that if you put into comparison, it's quite modest in terms of volume, and it's much more important for the transgenic plants, so for plants for which uh, genes has been inserted in a traditional manner or with the new uh, breeding techniques. And if you come back to the conventional uh, breeding, you can see that roughly it's around 80 uh, patent application per year which has a uh, file, uh, European Direct, so or the international application PCT. Just a, a rapid overview as well on the, the outcome of the, the, how the, the EPO is handling this type of application. So uh, you can see that lots are uh, withdrawn, refused or revoked, withdrawn because the applicant knows that he will never get the patent that he has in mind. Uh, and the EPO also sometimes oppose the, the granting of, of patents. So just to give you a flavor that uh, it's not only rubber stample activities, there is a real, real, real uh, uh, interest in, in, in seeing the, the merits of the, the application. Again, you can see the, 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 the different actions um, on this different application. So now turning to the, the legal framework, what is important to keep in mind is that uh, the, the Bible and the bracket of the EPO is the European Patent Convention because uh, I really insist on that because uh, the, the, the members of the, the EPO are really bound by this convention does not mean, for instance, that other treaty or other uh, piece of legislation are totally disregarded, but what is really binding for the EPO is the EPC, which is complemented by implementing regulation. And for the, 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 examin uh, the, the examiners, there are what we call the guidelines, where there are very specific and precise instructions to, to perform. Uh, the second source is the, the case law of the Board of Appeal, uh, of course, there are some decisions, and for the EPO, when we are uh, just assessing the merits of the different applications, we are taking into consideration the decision of the Board of Appeal. And in the case of the, the biotech uh, sector, this is the, the, the sole sector in which the EU has been active and uh, has enacted uh, legislation in 1998. And what you can see is that the, the year later, it was already implemented into uh, the, the implementing rules of the, uh, of the European Patent Convention. And it's also mentioned that this directive uh, could be used as a supplementary means of interpretation. So meaning that when there are some doubts, there are always the possibility to refer back to the, to the directive. So I just uh, spotted the main uh, provision of the, the implementing rules in which uh, the, um, the directive has been implemented. Uh, you can see that there are always the uh, equivalent reference to the, uh, in the directive because it's more or less verbatim uh, the, the, the wording of the directive. So there is no difference between the wording of the, the directive and the wording of the implementing regulation. 
What is quite important, you have a definition of the biological material, you have a definition of the plant variety, and the biological material is clearly referring to material containing genetic information and capable of reproducing itself or being reproduced in a biological system, meaning that it's quite a large uh, definition, which is uh, from the, the, the Biotech Directive Article 2.1. Um, and you can see that uh, it's not excluded uh, from the patentability uh, if this biological material has been isolated from its natu uh, na uh, natural environment. Uh, isolated does not mean that you just uh, put away, you know, uh, genes or something like that. You have really to reproduce out, uh, uh, outside and to really purify uh, the, 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 the genes, for instance, that you are looking for. And it's not because it's patentable that you will get a patent. Of course, there are other criteria that you have to take into consideration and to comply with for getting a, a protection. And in the, um, also something which is quite important uh, for my, uh, my presentation, uh, the, the, the plants and animal varieties are out of the scope of the, uh, the, the patentability. And then, of course, there is the question of uh, the plants and the animals itself, it's patentable because clearly um, the, the plants and the varieties is really a biological process to, to, to get them, so crossing and selection. When we are speaking about the plants, it's much more broader and it's much more the situation where you insert a gene into uh, a, biologic, a biological uh, system and then you get new uh, in individuals, new offsprings, uh, which will uh, present exactly the same quality and the same properties. So, um, what is also key, it's this provision, Article 53B, uh, which has been enacted in 1973 uh, because uh, it was clearly uh, the type of provision that you can retrieve in many different agreements. It will, you will have more or less the same one in the TRIPS agreement. Uh, they were also into the, 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 the Strasbourg Convention of the 60s on which the EPC is based and clearly said that essentially biological processes for the production of plants and animals are not patentable. But what about the product obtained by the, such uh, essentially biological processes? And then there were a decision in 2015 uh, by the Enlarged Board of Appeal to say that nothing prevents into the EPC corpus of law to grant some patents on the product, uh, so, uh, given, of course, that uh, the, the condition of patentability are, are met. Uh, so, um, uh, the European Commission uh, reacted to this decision and enacted a, a notice in November 2016 uh, after a quite thorough analysis of the discussion at the European Parliament and at the Council and reached the conclusion that it was not the intention of the legislator to allow the, the granting of, such, uh, of uh, the, the patent sorry, on such a, such a product. So uh, further to the, uh, the commission notice, there were some discussion at the administrative council. So as uh, you maybe remember, so the, the political part of the European Patent Organization. And the decision was to amend uh, the, the implementing rules to make sure that when uh, all the different steps are biological, so the product that you will get, you will obtain, will be out of the, the patentability. And it's the, the reason why we use exclusively, so it means that all the steps are crossing and selection. If there is a technical step, for instance, insertion of genes into the, uh, the genome of the, of the plants, then it will no longer be a biological step, and then it could be uh, protected by patents. What is quite interesting also to see, you have the list of the country which have uh, adapted also the legislation to make sure that the product is excluded from the, the patentability. What is important also to notice is that the, the, the Netherlands did that even before the adoption of the directive. And uh, so for the other countries, it's much more recent and most of them reacted after the, 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 the commission notice. Um, it was, we thought that it was the end of the story, but of course, in this type of saga, it's never the end of the story. And there were a decision in December by a board of appeal uh, in the so-called paper case, 
where uh, the board said that uh, the, the new rule that I just described was in conflict with the Article 53B uh, and because it was uh, going beyond what is really said into uh, this article and especially this article as interpreted by the Enlarged Board of Appeal. And there is a provision into the, the convention which, say, which said that in case of conflict between an article and a rule, the article should prevail. And so it's a reason why uh, the board say uh, the, the rule should be disregarded and the refusal of uh, the application then had no uh, legal basis. Again, after this de uh, decision, there, uh, there were some quite constructive and some... Um, vivid, let's say, discussion at the, uh, the Administrative uh, Council of the EPO. And the decision uh, was taken in, in agreement with the, the different uh, contracting states uh, to refer the question to the Enlarged Board of Appeal, which is the highest uh, um, court of the European Court of uh, the European Patent Office, to get some clarity on this question. And then, and then, Two questions were uh, asked to the, to the enlarged Board of Appeal. So what I just said, that whether uh, the administrat Administrative Council uh, has the power to, uh, to, to enact or to amend the implementing rules uh, to clarify uh, a specific article, uh, in this case 53B, even if such a decision has been already taken by the enlarged Board of Appeal to shed some light on the scope of this article. So this is the first question. And the second question is that if the reply is yes, do, do, uh, does the enlarged Board of, board of, board of Appeal sorry, uh, see uh, uh, um, a sort of conflict between this rule with Article 53B? Uh, so the position of the of the, the office, and it's uh, it was the initiative of the president. I just would like to highlight that it's not a decision. The, the, generally, uh, the enlarged board of appeal is seized by a decision of the board of appeal, which uh, which is seeking clarity on this issue. But in very rare case, it's possible for the president of the EPO to refer a question of law to the enlarged board of appeal. And this case was clearly this one. So it was an initiative of the uh, European patent office. Um, so, for, of course, for us, I think there is the possibility for the Administrative Council to amend uh, the implementing rules to clarify the scope of one article. It was clearly the intention uh, of the, the EU legislator, and we are clearly in line with the, 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 the position of all, I think, the, 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 the contracting states, all the states in Europe. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are some legislation which clearly goes into that direction. So for us, it's clearly possible. And this new rule is clearly in, in compliance with the Article 53B. What is quite interesting to observe is that uh, the Enlarged Board of Appeal has received 41 uh, briefs. So meaning briefs is the, the comments on the, the, the different questions. And there are, you can see that it's quite shared, uh, you know, views. There are 22 which uh, are in favor of the position of the office to say that uh, the, the Rule 28, Paragraph 2 uh, is totally legally sound. And then meaning that the product obtained by essentially biological uh, processes should be out of the, the, the patentability. On the other side, 17 does not share this view and should uh, are of the opinion that uh, patent should be granted for such invention. What is also quite interesting to, uh, to observe is that all the, the, the member states who uh, took uh, position on, the, on these briefs are all on the same line, so meaning supporting the position of the EPO. So, staying of the proceedings, meaning that uh, now in the, the pipe we have 250 cases uh, which are on this very specific question, and they, they have been, uh, they, the, 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 the proceedings have been stayed, so meaning that no more action are taking place for this case. But as I said again, uh, what we can do is only for the executive part of the office. So for the, the Board of Appeal, uh, they are not bound by the decision of the president to stay the proceedings. So meaning that there are 20, uh, 21 cases now before the, uh, the Board of Appeals. And 
for them, the proceedings are still uh, continuing. But of course, uh, all the, 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 the members of the Board of Appeal are aware of the existence of the, uh, of the, the referral. And I think that probably few, very few decisions will be uh, issued before the decision of the Enlarge Board of Appeal on this very specific case. Uh, regarding the duration of the case, uh, it's roughly between 12 and 21 months. If you consider that the referral uh, was made in April uh, last year, uh, we can expect uh, probably the decision around the, sun, the, the summer break. My very last words, and I think that I will be on time, uh, is the, the cooperation with the, the, the plant variety rights. So uh, really started in 2016 uh, because it was clear uh, that it was necessary to have more link to avoid uh, that the two institutions work separately uh, without any regards for the works done by the other one. And then uh, some workshop expert meetings, joint conference were organized since this date. And what is, I think, concretely speaking, what is really important is the new database, which has been developed together with the, the CPVO. Uh, in this database, so available, you can see that it's quite recent because it's one year now. Uh, all the technical uh, questionnaire uh, will be accessible for the examiner at the EPO. So meaning that they will be clearly aware if there is any uh, application for plant varieties. Uh, and then they can see, of course, it's very important for the question of the, the novelty and the inventive step. If um, uh, uh, an, an application is pending at the EPO, and in the meantime you receive the information in the variety de description or the techni technical questionnaire that all, more or less all the, the different aspects have been already uh, disclosed into, uh, with the, the CPVO, of course it will endanger the novelty or the inventive step, inventiveness of the invention. So I think it, it, it does not look at first glance some, as something very important, but in practice it's very important to connect the two institutions and to make sure that uh, everybody is aware of uh, the state of the art when assessing the patent application. So then thank you very much for your attention and of course I will be extremely happy to reply to question if any. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, I hope you have uh, a few questions about the status, but very, thank you very much for this very precise update on the status of products, especially of essentially biological processes. Now uh, we turn to uh, a double presentation. So by Claire Robinson, who's been editor at GM Watch, a not-for-profit organization that keeps the public informed about GM food and crops and associated pesticides for the past 20 years. So she knows what she's talking about. And Dr. Michael Antonio, uh, who's a reader in molecular genetics at King's College London at the Department of Medical and Molecular Genetics since 1994. So he also knows what he's talking about. He has published extensively on the topic, has many years of experience actually developing biotech products, and he has the status of inventor on different patents and they're going to explain to us why the regulation of genetic editing, so gene editing, wouldn't actually hurt small or medium ex, uh, enterprises. So the floor is yours for 15 minutes. So I'm gonna be speaking shortly on why the regulation of gene editing will not hurt small and medium-sized companies, SMEs. Um, you may know that there's been a lot of discussion about this within Europe. Um, this talk is, is loosely based on this article, which uh, Michael Antonio and I got together on GM Watch, but we are expanding on it today. So, as you know, uh, proponents of new GM techniques such as gene editing are trying to weaken or abolish the EU's GMO regulations in order to allow easier market access for gene edited crops or foods. They say that deregulation will open the market to small and medium-sized enterprises or SMEs and this will democratize GM and end the monopolistic de domination of big agrochemical companies like Monsanto Bayer. We think that this is highly doubtful because um, the first reason is that most startups fail and not because of regulation. Only 10% of all startups succeed 
Biotech startups have it even harder, even a smaller percentage succeeds. Why is that? According to an article on the biotech industry platform Lab Biotech EU, the reasons are flawed financial strategy, failure to attract the right investment, inexperienced management and bad science. They have a few other reasons as well, but excessive regulation does not come into it. Gene edited crops will not be easier to generate or cheaper to market than old style GM. With first generation GM crops, the cost of bringing a GM trait to market was US dollars 136 million. This is from a crop life consultancy report. Only 25% of that cost went towards meeting regulatory requirements. The rest was research and development. Gene editing won't change this because the generation of viable edited plants will take a similar input of resources and time and additional costs are the massive licensing and royalty fees paid to the CRISPR base patent holders. Um, and Dr. Antonio is going to talk more about this. So basically we think that gene editing will not change the biotech business model. Um, Dr. Antonio here has years of experience of developing biotech products and he holds inventor status on patents as has been said. Um, he points out that the same gene editing technology used in medical applications, which he's involved in, is also used in the plant livestock animal applications. So it's the same technology. And he'll explain why gene editing won't change the biotech business model. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Claire. So before I... I'm going to um, largely base... Um, the short, my short talk on personal experience of how I went through having worked with a startup that became an SME and how it then evolved is just graphically illustrates really the trajectory of, of, uh, of SMEs in the biotech sector in general. But before I do that, I want to return to this, um, one of the points that Claire showed on the last slide, and that is the daunting uh, the, um, the, license, the daunting license and royalty fees that any SME that tries to license a gene edited product is going to be facing. Um, and if, uh, so just to give you an idea, as of summer last year from a presentation I heard on, on patenting of CRISPR gene edited uh, products in both agricultural and medical spheres, there were well over 4,000 patent applications in the pipeline uh, using this technology. Now, according to the presenter, um, it was wishful thinking that they would actually, the most of these would ever be granted. And the reason for that is, if we go to the um, next slide, it's based on this fact here. What's listed on this slide um, is basically the organizations, individual and companies that hold the base patents on just about every conceivable use of CRISPR gene editing technology. They, they hold the rights. Anybody who comes after them uh, has to prove that what they do is not covered by any of these patents, first of all, to be patentable, which is why uh, the presenter, as I say, uh, that from where I get this slide, uh, thinks that it's wishful thinking that most of those patents will ever be granted. But if, if, any, if they do manage to get a patent on a product, they will nevertheless, because it's like to fall under these, they will have to take out licensing and royalty agreements with these, with these base patent holders, one or more, probably several, uh, more than one of these base patent holders, especially, say, the University of California, Charpentier, and Broad Institute, MIT, Harvard patents. Those are the key ones. So what does that mean? A small SME will be faced with a huge undertaking, a huge expense in coming up with an agreement, now, which could well be beyond its what it can uh, financially afford, which is why, if we go to the, um, the next slide, is that um, who has actually had the resources to Get these, li get these licenses and, uh, in, uh, and agreements in place. It's big agriculture biotechnology companies such as Dow DuPont has, uh, has uh, 
negotiated, a big company like that has been able to negotiate signed contracts with all the important owners of the base patents as listed on the last slide. And that now what, uh, what a, a, a small agricultural SME may be faced with if they think they, get a, they have a patentable product, they nevertheless have to at least minimally come up with an agreement with Dow, with Dow DuPont, if not with the base patent holders. So, this, uh, th so you then have to think if, uh, if, if an invest somebody is approached to invest in a company with this sort of uh, prospect, uh, you have to wonder whether we'll actually invest in the first place. But nevertheless, let's go back. Having said that, say uh, a company, a group of people, they think they've got a great idea and they um, using gene editing in agriculture and they want to develop a, a given product. They first have to raise... Um, uh, venture, some initial seed money, some venture capital, to just prove the principle of, of what they are um, considering doing. So say they raise that money, and say the initial work goes very well, and they end up with uh, a proof of principle, then they have to raise far more serious money from venture capitalists to then set up a, set up an ins uh, a facility to then take that development forward. And that's exactly what I was involved with at a, with a startup company called Therexis, a gene therapy company back in the 1990s. The venture capital was raised and then uh, a facility was built to actually take those gene therapy ideas forward. Now, bear in mind, venture capitalists invest in a, ideas in a, in a company because, not because they think this company is going to save the world, but because they want to make a profit on their investment. This is a very crucial, crucial point to bear in mind. Because what can happen uh, as if, so what happens is if, the, patent, if the, the, the work goes well and the patent portfolio of the SME begins to grow and it looks very strong, then uh, a, a, some different, a number of different outcomes can, can take place uh, from this. Either the company, ha in order to, say, get their products out to market, they have to raise yet even more investment money from venture capital in order to get a distribution network in place and, uh, and, and to out-license the, the technology to, to other companies. Or what, what can happen most frequently is that an SME can become uh, attractive to a bigger company uh, once its patent portfolio grows. And therefore, it, it can be subject to a takeover. We're, we're familiar with, no doubt, how large companies acquire other large companies. Uh, it's the quickest way to expand your product portfolio rather than develop it from scratch. No, go back, go back. I don't want that yet. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, they, um, they, they just uh, buy out another company. Like, for example, it could be huge, like the Bayer buyout of Monsanto for $63 billion or whatever. But actually, it takes place. This is far, these kinds of takeovers, takeovers are far more common at, at, with, uh, with SMEs, and which... So in addition to perhaps them failing because the science didn't pan out, they actually uh, can be bought out. Uh, you may think that um, the buying out of an SME by a bigger company would be very lamentable, would be very, very sad. But actually, it's not at all. Because actually an SME set, in a way, would set itself up for such a takeover. Because it's by far the quickest way for the investors to get a profitable return on their initial input. Venture capitalists look for a takeover because they will get their return on their investment far more quickly than waiting for the company to produce a product that's then manufactured and then uh, sold around the world either directly or through sub-licensing. And I can tell you that this is the outlook. The company that I was involved with, they actually, once their patent portfolio grew to very substantial, and that including patents you know, from the work that I was doing with them, from my ideas, they actually were approached by a takeover from a larger company. The CEO at the time refused the takeover. This caused great consternation within the company and especially the venture capitalists who had invented, and the CEO actually lost their job they were act, act, because they refused to accept that, that takeover at that time and, and the quick return. As it turned out, the company I was working with was later taken over by another company anyway. Um, they, in the end, um, 
decided to close the research and development arm of, uh, of the company that I was involved with and, and sold the IP rights, the intellectual property, the patent rights to a much larger company, which was then taken over by another company and so on and so forth. So I'm working now with a very large company called Millie Paul Sigma, American-based company, which has the patent rights to my, to my invention. But what I'm, what I'm illustrating here is, is that if, a, if an SME manages to get a patentable gene-edited agricultural product, the chances of it surviving in the face of the large agricultural biotech companies is probably very, very small. They will be very attractive, they're likely to be bought out, and they'll be happy to do so because they will get their, uh, their profit and, then, uh, and that the, the, those who are in the company can go on and do other things uh, with, their, with their return. This is, this is what I, uh, I've experienced personally and what I see um, happening a great deal. So what is my vision? I would say that, first of all, given the, the very daunting licensing and royalty agreements that a, a, comp a small company is likely to face uh, with the base patent holders and with the, uh, and with the Dow, Dow DuPont, firstly, first of all, that's going to be a big put-off. I think that it's not, it's not going to be very attractive to even go into, as a small company, to go into this sector. And it may have difficulty, therefore, attracting venture capital to even set up the company in the first place. And then, however, if it does, if it is successful, I think the big agricultural sector will buy out either to protect their products or to gain, to gain products from small companies. And so we will end up in a situation where we are now, back to square one, which is big, the big agricultural companies, whether they be Bayer, BASF, Syngenta, ChemChina, uh, uh, and so on, they will end up dominating the sector eventually anyway, even if we have a little flurry of startup companies uh, in, in the agricultural gene editing uh, sector, uh, if, if at all. And then, and, and again, that just will mirror what I've again seen before. Back in the 1990s, when gene therapy was hailed to be the, to be the cure of all illnesses in, 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 of, in humanity around the world, the startup companies sprouted like mushrooms, especially in the United States and, and even some in Europe. Only a fraction, a tiny, only a few of those actually survived. The vast majority just lost uh, because the science didn't pan out. They lost their investment. And I see things even, but at least at that time, you could patent. You can patent your gene therapy inventions. The problem I see with small startups in the agricultural biotech sector now is whether they'll be able to patent their product at all in the first place, given the base patents that are already there in place that are basically covering just about any application that you can imagine. So I will leave it there. Thank you. Oh, I don't know whether the last slide is worth watching, but just this last slide just illustrates this point of big boys buying up the small boys. This is in the food, uh, the food, the food sector, the seed sector, sorry. And as you could see, all the small blue, the small blue circles are small seed companies, and the big red ones are the big, big agricultural biotechnology companies. Corteva is DuPont, Bayer we know of, BASF and so on, ChemChina. So what they do with uh, once they end up with uh, in the agricultural biotech uh, sector, they're looking to buy out the small companies that will help them in the, distribute their GM seeds. This, it, for me, it will not be any different with, uh, in the gene ed with gene-edited uh, produced uh, products as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for this very enlightening and on-point presentation. Uh, the floor is now uh, for Mohamed Tar Torshizi, who is Assistant Professor at the Department of Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology at the University of Alberta in Canada. He's an applied economist and his research interests lie in the economics of competition and innovation, and notably in agricultural input industries, and he's gonna analyze the impacts of patents in different markets, especially in Canada and the US on farmers. The floor is yours, Mohammed. thank you. Um. I'm Mohamed Tarshizi, an agricultural economist at the University of Alberta. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me. 
Uh, very happy to be here for two reasons. One, uh, this is one of my uh, one of the issues that I'm really interested in. And second, when I left Canada, it was minus 30 degrees Celsius. So it's it's nice to be here. Um, I'm going to get right to the point. I'm going to talk about the uh, the impact of a stronger intellectual property rights in the seed industry. If you're aware of the proposed change, I'm not going to uh, uh, explain the, the details of the proposed change here. But the, the, the problem, as described in the conference's website, is that if, if the change does occur, it could bring a mass of new uh, genetically modified seed varieties protected by patents. Okay? So the important point here is that whether they are edited or modified, the, the new products and techniques are protected by strong intellectual property rights. It could be patents, it could be uh, other forms of property rights. Now, these strong intellectual property rights have certain economic implications. So the question I'm trying to answer today is, how will this new wave of patents or other forms of uh, IPRs, well, how will they affect the seed industry, specifically farmers and small and medium-sized uh, seed producers? So the objective is to provide a better understanding of the potential outcomes of the proposed changes uh, by providing some historical lessons from Canada and the U.S. We're going to talk about the, the, the theoretical underpinnings of the relationship between property rights, innovation, and market power. We're going to, I'm going to show you some, of, some, some, some trends in yields, prices, consolidation, financialization. Um, uh, then I'm going to talk about some of the empirical studies in, in this area before I discuss the conclusions. So, intellectual property rights, call it a double-edged sword. On one hand, you get more investment because, of, because investors can appropriate a higher rate of their investment uh, or the benefits of their investment resulting in higher rates of innovation, for example, higher yields. On the other hand, you get market power. And with market power, you get short-run and long-run economic inefficiencies, such as higher prices, higher seed prices, for example, and market concentration. Market concentration, one might argue, per se is not a problem, but market concentration could result in even higher seed prices, and higher seed prices, in the case of the seed industry, to the extent that they result in higher rates of profitability could create even higher rates of consolidation. Now, if you're worried about market, if you're worried about concentration, there's another form of concentration that uh, I'm going to discuss today, and that's called common ownership concentration, which is common, which is owner concentration beyond market level, concentration at ownership level. Now, market power may have uh, other major negative outcomes biodiversity, sustainability. I'm an economist. I can't really get into those things. But uh, the effect of market concentration on innovation itself is really interesting and a little vague sometimes. A lot of economists are followers of Joseph Schumpeter, the prophet of innovation. Schumpeter believed the prospect of above normal profit that comes with market power is the fuel that keeps the capitalist engine or innovation running. We need it. Without market power, firms are not going to innovate. On the other hand, there are studies that have shown these large multinational seed companies, if uh, uh, with high rates of profit, uh, they invest the smallest percentage of their profits back into research and development. In the case of canola in Canada, we have shown, we have found that only 10% of the, 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 their profits are reinvested back in research and development. The other 90% is a leakage from the system going to the shareholders of these seed companies. Okay? So let's take a look at seed prices in Canada and the U.S. I have corn, cotton, and soybean from the U.S., and I have canola from Canada. Seed prices in the U.S. for these three crops have increased by 300% in a 20-year period. Canadian canola, 600%. Okay? So before I delve deeper into what goes into these seed prices, I'm going to talk about the, some of the institutional changes. Hybrid varieties of canola came to Canada uh, late 1990s. Uh, by 2003, the market was dominated by hybrid varieties of canola. 
In the U.S., we have had a series of regulatory changes, court cases, amendments that provided the foundations, the environment for the introduction of gen genetically engineered varieties in 1996. So by the time G varieties were introduced to the market, imitation by rivals was legally prohibited. Farmers were also denied the right to save the seed and replant the seed or sell it to their neighbors. You can't find a seed cleaner uh, in the whole Midwest now. The Monsanto used to have police, something called Monsanto police. Uh, so the introduction of GEs is more important for, for soy and cotton because in the, in the corn industry, the corn industry was already dominated by non-durable hybrid seed varieties many years before that. So late 60s, the whole corn seed market was dominated by hybrid seed varieties. As I'm sure you all know, hybrid seed varieties, you can't really uh, replant the seed. Okay? So let's look at canola again. Before hybridization, we have had a relatively stable and low seed prices for canola between three and six dollars per acre. It's the cost of seed. After, it was after the hybridization that seed prices went up from 10 to uh, over 60 dollars per acre. As of right now, cost of canola seed is the most expensive item in our farmer's bill. One might argue, however, that while well, farmers are paying lower seed cost, but they didn't have a lot of yield gains, which is true. After hybridization, we have been paying higher seed costs for canola, but we have also seen a lot of yield gains. But you compare that with wheat, okay? A hexaploid crop for which breeding is much more difficult. This is a crop for which we have a farmer-funded and public research system. Farm farmers pay 1% checkoff. When they deliver their crops, that goes into research, and even that is voluntary. They could take it back. Okay? So you can see that with wheat, uh, which is much more difficult to breed, and we have a farmer-funded research and a public research system, we've had uh, pretty good yield gains. Okay? If you look at pulses, another crop that Canada is famous for, again, we have public and farmer-funded research, and we have witnessed even higher yield gains, and remember, for these crops, for wheat and pulses, farmers are practically paying next to nothing for their seed, compared to $60 per acre for cost of canola. If you look at soy in the U.S., seed prices have increased by approximately 300%. Uh, yield levels have improved, but at a much lower rate. Market concentration, on the other hand, has increased substantially. GE seeds area, seed varieties for which farmers cannot save the seed and replant it, dominated the market within a few years after 1996. Cotton, similar story, increasing seed prices, yield levels have increased, not at the same rate. Market concentration, difficult to find a trend in market concentration, but again, GE seed varieties have dominated the market. Uh, corn seed, again, they have gone from $30 per acre to, to $100 per acre. And this is not just the cost of seed. This obviously includes the technical fee. Part of the contract that you sign with the company is to pay a technical fee. Again, yield gains, yes, not at the same rate as the increase in seed prices. Market concentration has increased. Uh, but again, it not, as, not as much. So there's something else going on here that I will talk about in a little bit. So GE seeds area uh, has increased, but this is not as important as the other two crops because the corn market was already dominated by non-durable hybrid seed varieties before the GEs were introduced. Uh, my colleagues showed a more updated version of this graph, basically shows the number of seed co companies that, weren't, uh, that were purchased by the big six and a number of other companies in, uh, from 1996 to 2008. To the extent that, uh, to the extent that uh, one of Monsanto executives said that this is not just the consolidation of the seed sector, this is the, the consolidation of the entire food chain. 
We've had more recent changes, more recent mergers and acquisitions, Bayer and Monsanto, Dow and DuPont, Kim, China, and Syngenta. In addition to that, we have cross-licensing, something that some of my colleagues have called non-merger mergers. The idea here is that when you have such a concentrated market, when you have very few firms in the market, they don't need to get together to decide to increase the prices. They can signal their intentions to their rivals and they will follow suit. In a study, my colleagues and I showed that in, under certain circumstances, these firms may have incentives to agree upon tacit collusion by which they limit the utilization of CL technologies. So they may be able to provide something great for the market, but they will not do that if they fear that that new technology will destroy their older products and they will lose profit. They have the incentive to prevent uh, drastic innovations, if you like, uh, from, from coming to the market. Okay? In addition to that, we have a new trend called common ownership. The idea here is the, uh, common ownership is when you have inst is instance, instances where an investor holds minority shares in multiple competing firms in the same market. So imagine you have Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and Dr. Pepper, but they all have the same shareholders. So if they're all owned by the same guys, they have no incentive to compete. There is a very interesting literature on this. I encourage you to read it. Uh, it's, uh, it's in a paper we, uh, that we wrote recently, and uh, you can find uh, a lot of these papers in my reference list at the end of the, the presentation. Um, so if you look at the ownership of asset management groups, hedge funds, mutual funds, in the, seed, in the largest seed companies, okay? It has increased substantially since early 2000s. Bayer, for example, 80% of Bayer was owned by private shareholders, and uh, less than 20%, less than 20% by institutional owners, asset management groups. 2016, almost 50% of Bayer was owned by hedge funds, mutual funds, index funds. Okay? So this is something that has changed in the industry. Uh, so if you look at the shares of the top five asset management groups in the top seed companies, you can see that from 2000 to 2016, the shares of the top uh, asset management companies have in has increased significantly. BlackRock, for example, has significant shares in Monsanto, Bayer, Dow, DuPont, and Syngenta. Okay? So does Capital Group. So do, sorry, Capital Group, Fidelity, Vanguard, and State Street. Now, the problem here is that if you're worried about concentration, concentration does not end at market level. There is another layer, and that's ownership level. These seed companies are, in fact, connected through a network of their common owners. So... Whatever market concentration index you use and tells you there is this much concentration is an underestimation because the, the, these firms are actually connected through a network of their common owners. Okay? And as I mentioned earlier, when these firms have the same owners, they have less incentive to compete. So we did a study and showed that 14.6% of the increase in corn, soy, and cottonseed prices in the U.S. from 1997 to 2017 can be attributed to increase in common ownership concentration. Another 13.1% to market concentration, only 14.1% to innovation, and 58.2% uh, to stronger intellectual property rights against farm saved seed. Another study published in the Rand Journal of Economics uh, by Giancarlo Moschini and his colleagues showed that, uh, showed the benefits of GE innovations in the U.S. soy, corn, and seed varieties over 1996-2011 period. Farmers benefited by $14 billion from these innovations. The seed sector, however, benefited $23 billion. Uh, so, there is definitely innovations. There will definitely be innovations coming with a stronger intellectual property rights. There will be benefits for sure. 
but you have to be careful because on the other hand, these stronger, stronger intellectual property rights, whether they are patents or hybridization or anything else, they also bring market power. They also bring political power for the seed companies. They, they also bring a network of common owners creating perverse incentives for tacit anti-competitive agreements. They also bring a strategic behavior through cross-licensing. Okay? Uh, I can control my rival's output prices through the price of the license that I'm selling to them in my cross-licensing agreements. All of this resulting in very few firms in an oligopolistic market or monopolistically competitive market, most likely using their market power to uh, raise seed prices and more importantly dictate production decisions to farmers through contracts. Okay? So if you buy seed from them, you also have to, sign, have to sign a contract that tells you what else you need to do. So one of the major concerns is that this could eventually actually result in grain production and other forms of agriculture following the poultry model, where everything upstream and downstream of farmers is owned by very few poultry firms that have made farmers essentially low-paid low hired laborers on their own land. Uh, so I think from the viewpoint of farmers and the small and medium-sized seed companies who will get eaten up by those larger multinational companies, uh, probably not at a fair price, uh, it, it is, I think, imperative to keep in ownership of, of the seed. Uh, and and th I think some countries have very good research systems, France, Canada, in, in, in some crops at least, and, and a lot of times these, these uh, research systems are funded by, by farmers themselves where there is no leakage from the system. So this might be an option worth uh, exploring. Again, I want to emphasize that uh, I've uh, there will be benefits with innovation, and those benefits are very important. It's easy to keep innovations out, the te new technologies out. It's easy to let everything come in. I think the real question is, can we take advantage of the benefits of the innovation and try to minimize the cost that could come with these new technologies? Uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much for this enlightening, but also extremely worrying presentation, to be honest, if I'm, yes, I am worried. And uh, I think uh, our next uh, presenter is also, panelist is also worried, but uh, not discouraged. So I'm not sure he needs presentation, but our next speaker so is um, going to talk about the peasant's perspective. So Guy Kassler, peasant, uh, specialized in seeds, and everything related to seed issues for a very, very long time. Guy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oui, merci, Fulia. Et tout d'abord, merci aux trois orateurs précédents qui nous ont amené des euh, informations extrêmement importantes euh, dans le débat actuel. Alors, le débat actuel, c'est d'abord le Conseil euh, européen qui a pris deux initiatives euh, récemment, à la fin de l'année dernière. Il y a un problème avec la traduction. Vous me dites dès que ça marche et je reprendrai. Ça marche. Merci les traducteurs. Je pense qu'il faut aussi beaucoup les remercier pour leur travail. Donc euh, le contexte actuel, c'est d'abord le Conseil européen qui a pris deux initiatives à la fin de l'année dernière. Une première, en demandant à la Commission de faire un rapport d'ici le 31 décembre 2020, donc cette année, il reste quelques mois, pour reprendre une proposition qui avait été faite il y a quelques années et puis rejetée par le Parlement européen concernant 
la commercialisation des semences. Et puis une deuxième initiative, toujours adressée à la Commission européenne, pour qu'elle fasse un deuxième rapport, donc celui-là pour avril 2021, concernant ce qu'on appelle, alors il y a beaucoup de dénominations différentes, mais aujourd'hui il semble que le terme proposé soit les nouvelles techniques génomiques, puisque ça a été le vocabulaire employé par le Conseil et par la Commission. Alors, dans toutes les réunions, les instances, les échanges où on aborde ces deux problèmes, euh, j'ai l'habitude de dire qu'il y a un éléphant énorme qui se promène dans la salle euh, et dont personne ne parle. Et cet éléphant, eh bien, nous l'avons mis à l'ordre du jour aujourd'hui euh, avec les trois précédentes interventions, c'est euh, le problème du brevet. Et euh, mon intervention va être de vous montrer que peut-être il n'y a pas un éléphant, mais le début d'un troupeau d'éléphants, puisqu'on a un deuxième éléphant qui arrive, euh, dont on parle plus dans d'autres instances, que ce soit la Convention sur la diversité biologique, le traité international sur les ressources phytogénétiques, enfin je ne vais pas les citer toutes, qui s'appelle l'information génétique et le brevet sur l'information euh, génétique. Alors, mon point de vue n'est pas de vous faire un cours de droit, je ne suis pas juriste. Mon point de vue est de euh, vous montrer comment, euh, eh bien, ma foi, ces deux éléphants euh, sont en train de préparer une offensive euh, très violente contre les droits des agriculteurs. Alors, c'est vrai que bon, des brevets sur les semences, Jean-Luc Gall nous l'a bien montré, il y a un moment qu'il y en a en Europe... Nous, les agriculteurs, on ne se sentait pas directement concernés. Certes, on a observé ce que vous avez mis en lumière, cette concentration de l'industrie semencière, qui pour nous a quand même deux conséquences. La première, c'est un rétrécissement énorme de, semencière, de la diversité de l'offre semencière. Certes, il y a beaucoup de variétés, mais c'est toute la même génétique... Euh, C'est tout euh, pour faire le même type d'agriculture euh, industrielle avec euh, euh, beaucoup de pesticides et d'engrais euh, chimiques. Et ça, ce rétrécissement de la diversité de l'offre semencière, c'est directement lié euh, à cette concentration de l'industrie semencière et surtout à la disparition de toutes ces petites entreprises locales euh, qui nous offraient une grande diversité de semences adaptées à chacune de nos régions et à chacun de nos pays. La deuxième conséquence, c'est la multiplication des contrats. C'est qu'on a l'impression que l'agriculteur est libre de faire ce qu'il veut, mais en fait, euh, eh bien, quand il achète des semences à sa coopérative, euh, qui s'engage à lui acheter sa récolte, ou à une entreprise semencière qui n'est pas nécessairement coopérative, on lui fait signer un contrat, euh, il faudra qu'il utilise tel outil, euh, tel herbicide. C'est un phénomène que vous avez mis en lumière en Amérique du Nord. Il arrive euh, massivement chez nous euh, maintenant. Mais jusqu'à maintenant, on avait l'impression de ne pas être concerné parce qu'on a euh, une directive en Europe, qui est la directive sur les semences. C'est un, un règlement, en fait, euh, c'est le règlement de 1994 sur le euh, droit d'obtention végétale euh, qui dit que l'agriculteur, s'il rémunère le semencier, euh, il peut utiliser ses propres semences, il chute sa récolte et les ressemer. Et euh, dans la directive sur le brevet dont a parlé tout à l'heure Jean-Luc Gall, euh, il est bien dit que euh, ce droit-là, même s'il y a un brevet sur un trait génétique, sur une information génétique qui est euh, dans la variété, eh bien, en fait, euh, l'agriculteur peut ressemer sa récolte, y compris euh, s'il y a un brevet, il ne doit rien au détenteur du brevet. Il doit uniquement ré euh, rémunérer... Euh, le détenteur du droit d'obtention végétale. Et donc, aujourd'hui, les brevets n'ont pas encore interdit directement à des agriculteurs d'utiliser leurs propres semences. 
on sent venir qu'il y a des menaces. Si je suis contaminé par, euh, ben, ma foi, euh, un trait euh, breveté de résistance euh, à un insecte, euh, bon, le BT, ou de tolérance à un herbicide, le robot prédit, que je n'ai pas acheté des semences couvertes par un droit d'obtention végétale, euh, là, je tombe tout directement sur le brevet et je n'ai pas le droit d'utiliser mes semences. Pour l'instant, à notre connaissance, il n'y a pas eu de poursuite contre des agriculteurs. Euh, en France, euh, je suis français, euh, nous avons pris une initiative et le, le Parlement a voté une loi euh, disant qu'en cas de présence fortuite, accidentelle, d'un trait breveté dans des semences, euh, le droit du brevet ne s'applique pas. Donc euh, nous, là, il y a, a peut-être une initiative, une solution euh, à mettre en place au niveau européen euh, de manière à ce que si nos récoltes sont contaminées, que ce soit OGM ou pas OGM, par un trait breveté, euh, euh, nous soyons euh, protégés. Mais aujourd'hui, avec ces nouvelles techniques génomiques, ben, ma foi, on a un deuxième problème qui euh, se pose. L'industrie semencière qui demande à déréglementer euh, ces nouvelles techniques et, 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 et les semences qui en, en sont issues, donc il n'y a plus de réglementation OGM d'après leurs souhaits, ce n'est pas encore fait pour l'instant. Euh, plusieurs instances juridiques euh, nous ont donné raison, je veux parler de la Cour de justice de l'Union européenne et plus récemment euh, du Conseil d'État français qui a dit que la directive s'applique à ces techniques. L'industrie semencière dit, mais ce qu'on fait avec ces techniques, c'est la même chose que ce que fait la nature. Ou c'est la même chose que ce qu'on peut faire avec des procédés traditionnels, de mutagénèse traditionnelle, qui, eux, ne sont pas soumis à cette réglementation, puisque, d'après ce qu'a dit le Conseil d'État français, c'est uniquement les techniques récentes de mutagénèse, notamment ce que le Conseil d'État a appelé « édition du génome », et euh, mutagénèse aléatoire in vitro. Euh, donc, euh, si c'est la même chose, mais si c'est breveté, qu'est-ce qui se passe C'est la même chose que ce qui est dans mon champ, puisque euh, moi, je peux l'avoir sélectionné, récupérer des semences de mes parents qui ont fait des croisements, euh, euh, des agriculteurs qui ont sélectionné, et j'aurai le même trait génétique qui est breveté. Alors, si on parle le langage juridique on parle d'information génétique quand on parle du brevet, quand on parle de langage scientifique, on va parler du gène ou du trait génétique, tout ça, c'est la même chose. Le brevet, il n'est pas sur la variété, il est sur un trait. Si ce trait breveté est le même que celui qui est dans mon champ, eh bien, la portée du brevet s'étend aux semences qui sont dans mon champ, que j'ai moi-même sélectionnées. Et nous avons, dans la directive biotech, la directive brevet européenne, dont a parlé Jean-Luc Gall tout à l'heure, un article, c'est l'article 9, qui dit très clairement que la protection conférée par un brevet à un produit qui contient une information génétique, cette protection s'étend à tout produit qui contient la même information génétique. Et cet article-là ne dit pas que ça s'étend au produit directement issu de l'invention. Et quand nous lisons les brevets, alors c'est difficile de lire les brevets, ce n'est pas le passe-temps préféré euh, des paysans, parce que euh, c'est un peu ardu, c'est confus volontairement, mais on voit bien que des brevets sont accordés sur un produit, donc c'est un brevet sur un produit, donc sur le trait génétique, on va dire de résistance à un puceron, par exemple, euh, et pour pouvoir justifier de l'invention, on dit dans le brevet qu'on l'a obtenu avec une technique brevetable sans aucun problème. Une de ces nouvelles techniques génomiques qui est brevetable et qui n'est pas un procédé essentiellement biologique. Mais dans le même brevet, pas dans les revendications, mais quand on lit la description du brevet, il est écrit qu'on peut obtenir le même trait génétique avec la mutagénèse traditionnelle ou en faisant des croisements qui, eux, ne sont pas brevetables. Mais le brevet, il n'est pas déposé sur la technique brevetable. Moi, mes semences ne sont pas issues de la technique brevetable. Le brevet, il est posé sur le produit, sur le trait génétique, sur l'information génétique. Et cette information génétique est dans mes semences. Alors, vous me direz, mais quel est le lien avec le débat sur la réglementation ou la non-réglementation 
euh, des euh, nouvelles techniques euh, génomiques. Mais le lien, il est très simple. C'est que si ces nouvelles techniques génomiques, qui ne sont que la poursuite de la transgénèse, qui, elle, est réglementée euh, euh, au niveau de la directive européenne OGM, quand vous voulez demander une autorisation de commercialisation d'une plante génétiquement modifiée, vous devez indiquer et rendre public des procédés qui permettent de distinguer votre OGM, dont vous demandez la commercialisation, de toutes les autres plantes. Donc, à partir de là, si euh, celui qui a déposé euh, une demande d'autorisation de commercialisation d'un OGM qu'il a euh, protégé par un brevet, il dit « Mais mon brevet, c'est tant à tes semences qui sont dans ton champ que ton arrière-grand-père a sélectionné. » Moi, je lui dirai « Non, tu as fourni la technique pour distinguer ton OGM breveté de ce qui est dans mon champ. Et donc, tu ne peux pas revendiquer euh, la propriété de mes semences. » Il y a un petit peu de musique, là. Mais euh, si cette réglementation ne s'applique pas, moi, paysan, je n'aurai un, un outil qui me permettra de m'opposer à la revendication du détenteur du brevet qui dira « tes semences m'appartiennent ». Et ce qui va se produire pour moi, agriculteur, c'est la même chose qui se produira pour les petites entreprises semencières euh, dont parlaient euh, les euh, orateurs euh, euh, précédents. Et donc, il nous semble euh, aujourd'hui à, 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 à la Via Campesina Europe qu'il est urgent d'opposer ce dé, dé, débat maintenant, avant que la Commission euh, rende ces deux rapports. Donc là, je vous ai montré le lien avec euh, le rapport concernant la réglementation OGM, mais nous avons aussi un lien euh, avec euh, la, future euh, la future réglementation de la commercialisation euh, des semences. Nous sommes très contents et nous espérons que la Commission reprendra euh, la proposition qu'elle avait faite dans sa précédente euh, proposition. Alors, c'est un mot barbare. Hein, euh, les juristes ont décidé de parler de matériel hétérogène. Nous, on parle de semences population, c'est-à-dire qui sont diversifiées, qui ne sont pas homogènes, qui ne sont pas stables. Il semble qu'au niveau juridique, on va parler de matériel hétérogène. On est ravis de trouver ça à disposition sur le marché. Nous, paysans, on veut de la diversité. Et on veut surtout que les semences qu'on achète soient capables de s'adapter euh, à nos conditions de culture qui sont différentes d'un paysan à l'autre. Si c'est absolument homogène et stable, ça ne s'adapte pas. Si c'est hétérogène, ça s'adapte facilement. Et c'est très intéressant pour nous, surtout quand on nous demande d'abandonner euh, les pesticides et les engrais euh, chimiques. Mais le problème avec ce matériel hétérogène que nous souhaitons, c'est qu'il ne sera pas couvert par un droit d'obtention végétale, puisqu'il est hétérogène et que pour être couvert par un droit d'obtention végétale, il faut que ce soit une variété homogène et stable. Ça n'empêchera pas qu'il y ait un brevet sur euh, un des traits de résistance ou toujours au même insecte. On va prendre le même, le même exemple qui couvre ce matériel hétérogène. Et à ce moment-là, le droit du brevet va s'appliquer directement. Il n'y aura plus l'exception du fermier qui ne concerne que les variétés protégées par un droit d'obtention végétale. Le matériel hétérogène ne sera pas protégé par un droit d'obtention végétale, donc il n'y aura pas d'exception du fermier. Donc le titulaire du brevet pourra me dire « Tu n'as pas le droit euh, de reproduire euh, euh, la semence issue de ta récolte. » Et donc par rapport à ça, il nous semble urgent de poser la question euh, de la directive 98-44 et notamment de l'interprétation de son article 9. Nous, nous ne disons pas qu'il faut rouvrir la directive, la modifier, mais peut-être qu'il faut faire le même travail que celui qui a été fait euh, par le Parlement européen, par la Commission européenne, en ce qui concerne euh, les semences, les plantes issues de procédés essentiellement biologiques, pour dire qu'elles ne sont pas brevetables. Peut-être que de la même manière, et nous avons proposé cela au Parlement français, il a manqué quelques voix pour que ça passe, 
nous avons demandé que la portée d'un brevet ne puisse pas s'étendre à des semences ou des animaux, hein, parce que c'est la même chose pour les animaux euh, qui sont issus exclusivement euh, de procédés essentiellement biologiques, c'est-à-dire de techniques de sélection utilisées par les petits paysans et les petits semenciers, et que euh, la portée d'un brevet ne puisse s'étendre que ce qui est, à ce qui est directement issu de l'invention. Si c'est réglementé au GM, il y aura une traçabilité de l'invention. Si ce n'est pas réglementé au GM, il n'y aura pas de traçabilité. Et au niveau des brevets, quand j'interroge l'industrie, ils me disent « Ah non, mais nous, il n'y a pas de problème. Quand on a un conflit entre semenciers, nous, on sait reconnaître notre invention. On va chercher dans le contexte génétique, c'est-à-dire non pas le trait breveté, mais les autres modifications qui sont tout autour. Mais nous, paysans, on n'a pas ça. Nous, paysans, on ne connaît pas le contexte génétique qui accompagne l'invention. Il n'y a que le titulaire du brevet qui le connaît. Donc, nous ne pouvons pas nous défendre. Donc, il est absolument indispensable, aujourd'hui, que dans le droit du brevet, euh, eh bien, ma foi, il y ait une traçabilité, pas uniquement du trait qui fait l'objet de la revendication du brevet, mais du contexte génétique qui permet d'identifier euh, l'invention. Donc, c'est peut-être des concept très juridique dont je vous parle aujourd'hui, bon, mais moi je m'occupe pour la Via Campesina Europe de défendre les droits des agriculteurs et d'appliquer cette déclaration euh, de l'ONU euh, sur les droits des agriculteurs dans nos lois nationales et dans les lois européennes et dans le débat actuel sur les nouvelles techniques génomiques et sur la modification de la réglementation semence, il nous semble urgent d'aborder ces questions pour que euh, les droits des agriculteurs ne disparaissent pas. Je conclurai quand même en disant que les droits des agriculteurs, c'est pour euh, la population, l'ensemble de la population européenne, le droit à la liberté de choix de leur alimentation et le droit à la souveraineté alimentaire. Parce que ce qu'ont montré euh, les deux orateurs précédents, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, avec ce système de concentration d'industrie, avec les brevets, avec les nouvelles techniques génomiques, qui sait qui décide de ce que vous allez manger demain Ce n'est pas vous, les consommateurs. Ce sont ces trois ou quatre grandes entreprises qui détiennent les mêmes brevets et qui se partagent les parts de marché. Nous, les agriculteurs, nous ne pouvons plus rien décider. Nous sommes complètement verrouillés par ces quelques entreprises. Donc, ce n'est pas uniquement un problème de droit des agriculteurs. C'est vraiment le problème du droit à la souveraineté alimentaire qui concerne l'ensemble de la population. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Guy. So, thank you very much. So, before we actually uh, uh, open the floor to everyone, to, I know you must have burning questions or remarks, uh, we would like to give the floor to three commission services, if you may come around here maybe to uh, respond or to give a bit more uh, of a context from your side. So the first person who I'll give the floor to <laughs> is coming. <laughs> so Mrs. Uh, Sirku Hainima from DJ Santé, so uh, Public Health and Plant Health, uh, the unit of biotechnology, Then followed, he'll, she'll be followed by Thomas Weber, again DJ Santé for unit uh, plant health, dealing mostly with seed marketing issues as well. And uh, Mr. Alfonso Carlos Sanchez from DJ Growth, uh, who's from the unit intellectual property. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting all of us here. And I just want to apologize for my head of unit, Chantal Pruzzi, who was supposed to be here today instead of me, but unfortunately, She had a last-minute uh, change of uh, schedule. So um, it has been extremely interesting. I don't say that the topic is to totally unknown for us, but it's a very nice uh, compilation of subjects that you have put together, and uh, I very much appreciate these uh, frank presentations that have been uh, given this morning. Um, I'm here because I'm from the unit on biotechnology, so maybe I just say a couple of words on on the work that the Council of uh, Council has asked the Commission to do. 
regarding the study on new genomic techniques. So as a background, um, there was the famous court case in July 2018 where the um, Council of, um, no, not Council, the Court of Justice of the European Union um, clarified how the Directive 2018 on deliberate release of GMOs uh, to environment should be interpreted and the, the court clarified the scope uh, saying that uh, any new technique that alters the, the, um, the um, or alters the gen genes um, leads to a GMO. So any new technique that has been developed since 2001 when the directive came into, into place uh, leads to a GMO. So therefore, um, all these new techniques that were also mentioned today, CRISPR for example, uh, when you use them, they lead to a GMO and therefore they are regulated under the EU legislation on GMOs. Now, uh, Council, um, basically, the, let's say, say this way, the member states who have to implement this uh, current legislation, uh, they have had discussions with the Commission how to do it with this, with this uh, interpretation. And somehow Council uh, saw that there is a need to look more closely to the, to the basically to the status of uh, new genomic techniques and therefore it asked uh, Commission to do a study and the study is really that's how the Council puts it on the status of new genomic techniques under the Union law so that's GMO law and in the light of the uh, Court of Justice uh, the ruling so as interpreted by the co court so this is what the Commission is now doing. This is ongoing work. We, have, um, we are organizing this work where we have, uh, we have, let's say, several things that we want to put together. Uh, one important part is the targeted stakeholder consultation, which includes member states and EU-level stakeholders to gather information and data. Uh, on the use of these techniques, on the potential use of these techniques and concerns, uh, challenges, opportunities, benefits. Uh, so like a package of uh, issues, questions that the Commission also has around these techniques. It, the, the study will also have an element of um, safety because European Food Safety Authority has been asked to to look into the risk assessment of, of these techniques and give us an overview based on their own previous work and the work of the national risk assessment bodies. There will also be a an scientific element in the study because the Joint Research Centre has been requ uh, requested to carry out, to give us an um, overview of the market applications, what, what in fact is there out there already, what will be out there possibly of products that have been developed with these techniques and also on the state of art on the actual techniques themselves. Finally, there will also be an, possibly an, uh, an element of ethics because the European group of uh, ethics, I always forget the nice uh, long title that they have, EGE is the abbreviation, they are also in fact in parallel working on a opinion on um, ethical opinion on gene editing which is uh, quite large because it also contains its humans animals plants microorganisms this work has been ongoing for a while already but as it should be ready sometime this year maybe it can also feed into this study so I would say that we are trying to uh, have a quite a holistic approach to this request that was given to the from the Council, so not maybe just like a legal analysis. This is not what we are really doing because for us the legal clarity is already out there from the from the um, court. But we try to give other elements into this. Now, having said that, what do we do with this study then? Well, we have a deadline for the study, and the only thing we know is that uh, we are not prejudging anything. Council has asked then the Commission to consider if there's some follow-up that should be then done based on this study. What that follow-up will be 
we do not know today and we are not pre-chatting we are really keeping our mind open and we are only asking for a substantiated good quality in contributions from anybody who is uh, part of the stakeholder consultation so that we then also can hopefully provide a quality study so that was i just wanted to clarify from our side uh, what is it that that's that's the only thing that our unit is actually working on at this moment related to the new genomic techniques thank you thank you very much Okay, this comes a little bit uh, earlier than I thought then. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm a little bit the, the odd man out uh, from, from the Commission uh, here today because uh, we are very little involved with this uh, issue on uh, patents. Uh, of course, we deal with uh, plant variety rights uh, in, in our unit, but uh, so this issue of patents is a, is a little bit outside of our uh, competence. However, I think there were uh, several issues that uh, addressed today which uh, also are also very relevant to, to our work, uh, so seed marketing legislation, uh, plant genetic resources uh, issues. Um, so I just uh, quickly want to address a few of the points that came, uh, came up. Um, so I uh, was very uh, uh, yes, uh, closely following uh, Mr. Toshitsi's uh, 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 very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, yes, uh, one one thought I had is that of course in in, in, in the EU we have quite a different regulatory uh, environment. So how much of these findings are directly transferable to the EU is uh, is, is another issue. Of course, the crops you mentioned are mostly GM crops, or exclusively nearly GM crops, which is not the case case in Europe, and. Uh, so, yes, I, I think it, you have to be a little bit careful about the transferability of these uh, findings. Um, I also want to draw attention to a very interesting uh, OECD study, which was published, I think, one or two years ago on the concentration of the seed market, which also has some quite interesting methodological, uh, say, insights. In, uh, and uh, I think this is quite... Uh, complementary to, uh, to earlier and to findings on, on this issue. So this is uh, highly recommended from, from our point of view. And it actually shows really a very complex picture of concentration, so where there are differences between crops, between re uh, regions in the world. And uh, also, of course, I think it reflects uh, regulatory differences in, in different regions in the world. So I think, uh, yes, the other point that was uh, uh, addressed by Mr. Kassler, uh, it's uh, the issue of uh, digital sequence information, which is uh, directly uh, affecting uh, our work and in, in different contexts, in, especially in the context of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, which faces the same issues like uh, Nagoya, CBD on uh, if access and use of digital sequence information should trigger benefit uh, sharing uh, obligations. As many of you will know, this is a very contentious topic and there are ongoing discussions uh, in the context of the preparation of the CBD uh, conference of the parties. Uh, from I don't have a ready-made uh, question on that. Uh, there are, of course, let's say from the context, from the uh, perspective of the international treaty, there are legal issues. So the, the EU position in some respects are very clear that the international treaty only applies to physical genetic uh, resources. And uh, so apart from, from that uh, quite legalistic issue, uh, the EU also prefers to have open access to uh, the results of research and uh, to data coming from research. And uh, because they are, the treaty as Nagoya and CBT has three objectives, and uh, it's the conservation and sustainable use of uh, 
of, of the genetic resources and, of course, the uh, access and benefit sharing. But this open access to data is really very important for achieving the first two objectives, the conservation and sustainable use. So, of course, uh, it has to be – all these three objectives have to be balanced. So, to, to find a balance – okay, we are in the process. There's an international discussion. So, I uh, – it's ongoing and, uh, let's say, it's, a, it's, it's not closed, that issue, and it will not remain closed. So, Mr. Kassler also uh, mentioned uh, heterogeneous material. Uh, I, uh, I note and acknowledge the concerns uh, with uh, intellectual property rights, especially patents in that respect. Uh, so, this – I hope that – at least also the EPO uh, ruling in future will have <laughs> had to have some clarification, clarification on that. Uh, so you are all aware that there is a request for council study on the new genomic techniques, but there's also uh, a council request on a study concerning the options to uh, update the seed marketing legislation. Uh, we have an earlier deadline, so uh, by the end of, of the year. So it, uh, an outcome of the study might be that there is a, a new opportunity to, to amend uh, to a certain extent the seed marketing legislation. And I think also, of course, since 2013-14, when the first revision was attempted, uh, there were a lot of developments. So, of course, uh, we had the organic regulation under which uh, uh, this uh, specific uh, delegated act on heterogeneous material uh, is currently discussed and will be – should be adopted uh, by the end of the year. Uh, we also carry out a so-called uh, temporary experiment, uh, so trying to establish a specific testing regime for organic varieties, uh, for organic – specifically for organic agriculture. So this work has, has just uh, – started and, uh, well, cannot anticipate uh, the outcome, of course, uh, but, uh, of course, we also have to see now that with the Green Deal and Farm to Fork strategy, the political context of, of any revision uh, that will come has, has changed, so, uh, uh, so any revision that might come will be done in this, this context of the objectives and aims of the, of the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. And, uh, so I, I hope uh, that at least some of the main concerns of, of this sector uh, can be uh, addressed in a, in a satisfactory uh, manner. So a little about patents from my side, but uh, that's what I uh, can say for the, for the moment. Thank you. I work in DigiGrow in the unit dealing with uh, IP, with intellectual property in, in general, not only patents, but also trademarks, designs. Uh, um, <coughs> Um, and we deal basically with the legislation, of course, also with policy, and we also take care of some international organizations like uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, the European we, – we also attend the, 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 the govern, government and technical bodies of the European Patent Office, and also the, the EU IPO, the, the agency in Alicante, but they deal with the trademarks, designs, etc. I would comment quickly through the three interventions that uh, I, I heard today. O on the first one of Mr. Antonio, uh, he raises things that uh, we, from a policy perspective, we, we, we face a lot, not the role of patents and licensing for uh, small companies, universities, start-up. I mean, in Europe, uh, already for many years, we are trying to improve our knowledge-based economy to be more competitive on this front of innovation. I heard the names of several universities today that they own a lot of patents on these new technologies like scripts, and, I, and none of those universities are based in, in, in the European Union. And that maybe is a, a symptom of our lack of competitiveness. It's a pity that those technologies are, are not uh, generated by uh, European universities. And patents and licenses, the, the examples were clear, they, they help to develop these startups and universities. For example, I work a lot in the pharmaceutical field, and we know that 
UK, many universities, startups develop medicines, especially in the last years, apparently the last decades, the new, the really new active ingredients, the new molecules, the new, the real breakthroughs, they come from academia or from startups. And then at some point they are taken by big companies that develop the medicine because sometimes the startups, universities, they cannot develop the clinical trials. And in, in your sector also sometimes happen with the field trials. So it's clear that patents and license, they, they, they play a, a key role in, in innovation in having also a more diversified uh, innovation um, uh, components because uh, we, that habilitates the work of SMEs, big companies, universities, um, etc. And we, and now I, I move to the second point. Uh, I, I saw all these things of ownerships. I think that those names that we saw there are pension funds. And again, I, I think none of them is European, because in the U.S., if, if our let's say counterparts, we, if we were in the U.S., every month we would be putting a big part of our salary in all these pension funds. So every month in the U.S. they generate trillions of euros or, or dollars in pension funds that they go all around the world. For example, also again, in the pharmaceutical sector, we see that in Europe, many startups that develop medicines. At some point in the last round of uh, funding, all these venture capitals from U.S., pension funds, they come and they take these companies. I mean, uh, what I heard from the presentation of Mr. Torsici, it's something that I, I see across the board, not only in, 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 in this sector. Even I think that the owner of the Brussels airport is one of these pension funds, and I think from Canada. And I heard in the debate of this change in flights routes that uh, you could not do anything because the Canadian pension funds, they will complain. So pff, this second point, I don't see much the, the – in this second point, I don't see much – uh, the, the patent point. Okay, I, I understood from some slides that all these big companies and, and big owners, they can, this uh, ownership of patents can facilitate their, 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 their strategy. But uh, I, I see more a competitiveness angle, not something, let's say, for my unit to, to do. I mean, maybe there is a competitive uh, or a general issue of how the economy works in, in general. And then the third presentation, uh, from Mr. Kastler. Um, okay, uh, I have some notes on Article 9 of the directive. We, we take care of this directive. This directive on biotech in, uh, technologies is my unit, and we take care of, of, of this directive. Uh, there was this proposal, if I understood right, of uh, improve uh, the way Article 9 works, that it could be done through a uh, some sort of notice like the one that we developed for the, for the essentially biological uh, products. But I think there it's helpless, I think, because I think that what Mr. Katzler was proposing on Article 9 is really to change what the Article 9 says. So I think we cannot do that through a, a, a notice because it's not about giving clarification. I think it's really to change the, the scope of this Article 9. So we would need a hard legislation. I mean, really a, an amendment, I think. Uh, of course, I don't know if other, other avenues could be found, like uh, memorandums of understanding. I'm thinking out, out of the box. I don't know if memorandums of understandings between the industry and, and farmers' organizations. For this, I think you will need to be uh, really organized. For example, now in Spain, for, I come from Spain, now for several weeks we have uh, the farmers uh, conducting out of protest in Spain in many different regions because of the prices that they get for the products that they, they, they sell, no? and, and it's all over the, the media. And I, I, I read some comments that probably they need to, 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 to be better organized. I don't, I don't prejudge this, but, I, but if we have to go for memorandums of understanding or things like this with the industry, I, I guess that to have a good organization, to, to be uh, well organized, it could help. Again, it's, it's something thinking out of the box. Um, uh, there were 
also some comments from Mr. Katzler, but I think they relate to the plant variety legislation that we have in the EU. I mean, it's something to be addressed there. I, I, I understood this thing of, uh, I took a note, these heterogen things. So there, I think. And then there, there is something, it's just a question, if, if Mr. Katzler, si, si vous pouvez répéter, vous avez expliqué quelque chose ou quelques propositions, le moment où on fait la... la où on fait la demande des de certificats de OMG, vous proposez quelque chose, euh, vous pouvez répéter ce qu ce que vous... Oui, donc j'ai fait trois propositions concrètes. La première, c'est que la portée du brevet... Euh, ne s'applique pas en cas de présence fortuite ou accidentelle de gènes ou d'une information génétique brevetée dans un lot de semences et on pourrait ajouter moi je suis éleveur dans un troupeau d'animaux ça c'est le problème des contaminations la deuxième proposition que j'ai faite, nous l'avions portée au Parlement français, c'est que la protection, je vous lis l'article 9, en le modifiant, vous avez raison, je propose une modification. L'outil juridique pour le modifier, vous êtes plus compétent que moi pour savoir quel est le bon. La protection conférée par un brevet à un produit contenant une information génétique ou consistant en une information génétique ne s'étend pas à toute matière issue d'un procédé essentiellement biologique. Donc, ça, l'outil juridique, il euh, y a des parlementaires, il euh, y a la commission, il y a le conseil, euh, je pense que c'est de leur ressort. Le Parlement français était très proche de l'adopter, et ça m'intéresse d'avoir votre avis. C'est sous intervention d'un député qui défend euh, l'industrie du médicament, euh, qu'ils ont dit qu'ils euh, avaient besoin d'expertiser plus longtemps cette proposition avant euh, de l'adopter. La troisième proposition que j'ai faite, c'est qu'il y ait une traçabilité dans le droit du brevet des produits issus de l'invention brevetée. Puisque l'information génétique brevetée ne se distingue pas de ce qui est issu d'autres procédés, notamment les semences paysannes que nous produisons, nous les paysans, ou celle des petites entreprises semencières. Aujourd'hui, la traçabilité des produits issus directement de l'invention, elle n'est pas publique. Il n'y a que le détenteur du brevet qui dit, moi, je fais une action en contrefaçon et je peux prouver euh, que euh, c'est euh, mon invention ou que ce n'est pas mon invention. Donc là, il y a une carence dans le droit des brevets pour l'instant, cette carence, elle est compensée par le droit sur les OGM, qui rend obligatoire d'indiquer le procédé qui permet de distinguer un OGM breveté des autres plantes ou animaux. Mais si ce n'est pas OGM, qu'est-ce qu'on fait Là, il y a une carence. If, um I would like to propose one thing. So could the panelists who have talked before maybe uh, have two minutes to respond to, because you've made the, some direct comments were made. Uh, Jean-Luc, for instance, I would like also to, for you to explain the disclaimer, for potentially the effect of the disclaimer practice that was taken, and then uh, Mohammed, and, and then we'll open the floor for questions for you, okay? Thank you very much, Fulia. Uh, 
First, of course, in my position uh, as a member of the uh, European Patent Office, I'm not, um, I cannot speak about what happens after the grant of the, the patent, but there are a lot of different things, and in the directive that uh, Guy referred to at several occasions, uh, there is the, the farmer's privilege, so it's also applied to the, to the patent, not only to the plant variety rights, but it also applied to the, to the patents. Uh, it's Article 14 or, or 13 or 14 of the directive. Um, it's, by the way, the same provision than in the regulation uh, to 2194. Um, for, the, for the question of the disclaimer, I think, yeah, uh, the objective, and of course everything was linked with this Rule 28, Paragraph 2, which is under discussion, let's say like that, and we are waiting for the, for the feedback of the enlarged Board of Appeal. But what was developed and what has been developed by the European Patent Office is to make sure that if you get a patent so on the product obtained by new breeding technique, let's say by uh, CRISPR-Cas-like uh, uh, inventions, uh, if uh, exactly the same product is obtained by essentially biological processes, it will not fall uh, uh, in the scope of the protection of the patent. So meaning that someone who has absolutely not used the teaching of the invention and has developed a natural product by crossing and selection, it will not face the limitation of the uh, same product or same pro product obtained by a different uh, a different mode of realization and especially by using some new breeding techniques exactly because the, the, the fact was to, to make sure that on one side if there is a real uh, invention uh, using some uh, technical uh, development, technological development, then you will get, a, you will be rewarded with the patent, but of course the scope of the patent cannot go beyond what has been offered to the society with the technological development, and if something is developed by the classical crossing and selection, there is no reason why uh, it should be also covered by the, by the invention. Thank you. No, I, I was I was curious. Um, sorry, I have to ch check your names, uh, Alfonso. I think uh, what I heard from Alfonso is that the concerns that I raised, he was essentially um, not confirming, but they they, they are shared. That when a, a, a university spin-off, you know, a small entity, comes up with a valuable invention, inevitably it's it ends up under the ownership of, of uh, a large corporation, a large pharmaceutical company or a large ag, ag, ag biotech company. And so you end up with this concentration of ownership uh, and licensing rights and, uh, and so forth with all of the downsides that that leads. In other words, it doesn't really lead to this uh, proliferation of S SMEs that uh, are somehow uh, contributing to a much bigger economy. No. It, you come back round to concentration of, of ownerships because a small company doesn't have the resources. They have to reach out to a more resourceful organization or company, uh, or they intentionally. I can guarantee a university spin out. The best thing that they would like to happen is that they get bought up because then they end up with their return quickly and the product gets out for societal benefit. So, yes, that's all I really have to say. I appreciate the comments. Uh, thank you so much. Um, regarding Mr. Weber's uh, comment that uh, I apologize if I in any way implied that the picture that I showed you from Canada and the U.S. is exactly what, what will be repeated in, 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 in Europe. That's not what I was trying to say. Uh, I think the point I was trying to make was that what connects the two pictures is stronger intellectual property rights. It could be GM hybrids. It could be non-GM hybrids. It could be something completely different. It could be patents. It could be anything that uh, implies a stronger intellectual property rights. Now, the economic literature is very clear about uh, the impact of intellectual property rights. And they have certain outcomes, regardless of whether it's in China or or Europe or anywhere else, as long as they're implemented and policed properly, 
they have uh, anti they have some uh, some effects on innovation and competition so so i wasn't trying to say that this is what will happen here but uh, I'm just trying to show you what has happened in europe the interpretation is left to the audience regarding mr uh, sanchez's comment uh, common ownership uh, concentration and financialization in a more general sense is widespread. Uh, you mentioned airlines. There is a famous study published in the Journal of Finance uh, by Jose Azar. Uh, it looks at the effect of common ownership in uh, in the airlines industry. Right. But, but they have shown that it has caused higher airline prices, for example, right? But if a disease spreads, to every person in a country, it doesn't make it less dangerous, or it, we, we shouldn't really just ignore it because, it, well, everybody's got it, so it could still be dangerous. So what I was trying to say is that if you, if you accept these stronger forms of intellectual property rights, uh, there are certain things that come with it, and this is just one of those things that comes with it. Uh, it's, I think it's a competition issue. I think it's an antitrust issue. Somebody else has to deal with it. I was just trying to show a picture of what kind of things you can expect with a stronger intellectual property rights. But I agree with you 100% that, that, that this is actually way more widespread than uh, what, I, what I implied, maybe. So I apologize if I was, uh, if, I, if my, the picture that I showed was a little narrow. I'm sorry. Now the floor is yours. Do you have any questions? Please just uh, indicate who you're asking the question to and try to keep it short if possible. Yes, Juliette? Uh, good morning. I am Juliette Leroux. I am working for the Greens in the European Parliament. Uh, I am an uh, agriculture advisor. Um, I, I actually had uh, first an information to give is that the Parliament also gave an opinion to the EPO on the case that was presented by Mr. Gall and that we uh, very much uh, uh, shared the uh, plus opinion. So that means actually all the member states who gave an opinion and the European Parliament all have the same opinion, which means the co-legislators which are behind the directive all are pretty clear on what should be applied, uh, implemented. Um, I wanted to come back on what Mr. Weber's, Weber said about uh, organic farming and the fact that heterogeneous material is going, uh, I mean, a rule is going to be implemented for organic farming before it's going to be implemented for the rest of the farmer. Uh, normally, the regulation is uh, um, entering into, I mean, implementa implementation uh, next year, so beginning of 2021, uh, which means indeed, uh, if we could <laughs> think about solving the pot potential problem that uh, Guy uh, talked about, uh, about, about patent and heterogeneous material, quite quickly it would be good, or the first to, to have to deal with it will be the organic farmers which I think is not really fair. Uh, yes, that's it. Thank you. I think that was more of a comment, right, <laughs> than a question. So if you have um, any other questions from the audience? There are no bad questions. Okay, Fran okay yeah. Question. Francisca and then Claire, okay. if comments are allowed, okay? Because <laughs> of course the question has a, you know. So, uh, Francisca Achterberg, Greenpeace, uh, and this is towards the, um, uh, the, the biotech unit uh, in, in DG Sante. Um, we're of course intrigued by the study that you're carrying out on request of the council. And we, um, th there was one question that we're particularly worried about um, in, you know, earlier d years, like in 2011, 12, 13, the industry were asking um, the Commission to interpret um, EU GMO law to tell them whether new techniques such as, you know, CRISPR and, and others derived, you know, genome editing techniques are covered by the EU legislation. And the Commission rightly refused to answer that question and said this belongs to the court. 
uh, especially after the, the question was referred from the Conseil d'État to the European Court of Justice. Um, now, I cannot understand why the Commission would now, after the ruling, after the, you know, the situation has been clarified, you know, venture into a study on the legal status of genomic techniques, new genomic techniques, including genomic, uh, uh, genome editing, um, uh, you know, after that has been clarified. So, you know, in my view, that should not actually be part of the scope of the study because the court, as you said yourself, has already clarified that. And um, just to be perhaps a bit, you know, too detailed or facetious, you know, the, the mandate, the way I read it, says very clearly, the council requests a study in light of the ECJ ruling on the status of new genomic techniques. And I don't think anything else would have found a majority in the council. So that's um, a comment, but also a, a plea to clarify that this is not about the legal status. Thank you. So I don't think we are disagreeing here with the, <laughs> with the, uh, with the Greenpeace. Um, we, it's correct what you said in the past. We did not provide such clear legal clarification to the, actually to many many developers who wanted to understand do, if they need to go through a authorization process on on a possible product that they were interested in. Uh, we didn't do it because exactly it's it's the prerogative of the Court of Justice to to decide how to how to read the EU legislation. So. Definitely, we are not reinterpreting what the council is saying. The, the word status for, for us, that council is asking us to clarify, we thought it would also include description of the legal status. So we are not reanalyzing anything. We are probably saying the court said this, this is the directive 2018. On the basis of this, we are now interested in all the products, all the techniques that have been developed since 2001. Uh, when the 2018 directive became applicable. So I don't think we are, I think we are agreeing on what is the, what the study is trying to do. So we are definitely not making a new legal analysis of something that for us is quite clear, actually. For us, the court ruling is clear. Everything leads to a GMO, more or less. <laughs> Always. You had a comment, Claire? Francisca just asked my question, so that was it. Thank you. Yes, I, I just have um, like a, a point of clarification from Jean-Luc. Um, say, uh, say somebody uh, files uh, a gene edited plant based on, say, a, gene, a simple scenario, a gene knockout. And that also embraces a concept that says, if this gene gets knocked out, in this case by CRISPR, this is the outcome and, and this is what we're claiming in the, uh, in the, amongst our claims, uh, the patent claims. But say I come along after this patent and I generate the same gene knockout, but not through the uh, gene editing tools such as CRISPR, but say through a random mutagenesis or s uh, something else. Will, will my, so I've knocked out the same gene. Will this product fall under the patent of the, uh, of the, of the filing of that, that first claim, of that first patent, the owner of that first patent? <laughs> that is my question. Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I think that I cannot probably reply directly to the question because it depends on many factors. I think first, random mutagenesis from a patent point of view, it's not natural process. So meaning that uh, because there is a, and I really insisted on that previously, I think uh, the, 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 the biological is crossing selection. So when you are using, the, let's say, the classical breeding tool, uh, in the case of the random mutagenesis, and I know that I, we, we would disagree with the guy just uh, next to me, 
uh, there is a, a human intervention, of course, because you will induce the result. And, and afterwards, the, the invention will be not only the result, but the selection of the different product that you have get, and then you will claim. So, meaning that if there is a product which is obtained by a targeted uh, mutagenesis, let's say like that, and the same product that is obtained by a random mutagenesis, I think probably it will be quite tough discussion to know exactly what is covered by the patent. I think there is no blanc as I mentioned, for, I think, uh, the, the case of a plant that you have obtained uh, by inserting a specific gene uh, into uh, an existing one and then you get a, a, a new product obtained by a targeted mutagenesis and the, 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 the case where there is crossing and selection and then you reach the same result. And in this case, of course, by the use of disclaimer, you can exclude this second product. But in the case you refer to, which is much more complex, I think it's probably you will have a problem of patent scope and then to really have a look on the claims and to see what is protected or not. And whether what is claimed could be equivalent to what could be obtained by a random mutagenesis. Thank you. We had a question from Mute and then others maybe. Um, hello, I'm Mute Schimpf. I'm working as a food campaigner with Friends of Earth Europe. And first of all, I want to thank you for this super interesting, quite technical <laughs> um, event. It's, uh, I learn a lot. Um, I also I have my first question is to Mr. Gall. In the discussion here, you said that the legal basis for patents on plants would guarantee farmers a right to save their seeds but when this is not implemented because i mean the only patented seed grown in europe is the gmas from monsanto uh, now from Bayer, and i knew there were contracts that farmers prohibited to save their seeds so i mean if it's possible then i don't understand how the situation in reality is not in line with the patent law and then I want to, sorry, I struggle pronouncing your name, um, Torshitsi. <laughs> Thanks for this excellent presentation. I knew there was a research comparing the actual innovation by GMOs and conventional beating between Europe and North America's, I'm not sure if Canada was included, from a European group of scientists. So it's really sharpening the thinking. And for me, the bigger question is, I mean, from your personal view as an economist, do you actually think the economic implications of such a strong IPR system that hampers fair market conditions and that hampers innovation of com potential competitors is something that you will see as sustainable? As I ask you this as a person, not as an economist. <laughs> Let me just make sure I understand the question properly. So, uh, as an economist, do I think that uh, the benefits, well, the, the, everything that comes with these innovations, the, these ne technology, uh, will result in fairness? Or, or uh, you describe the, Im the impacts. If you yeah. have such a strict IPR system, yeah. either on hybridization or on GMO, patents on GM seeds, does it go align that for sustainable development for societies or for a specific sector? Uh, I think, like, similar to anything else in, a capital, in the capitalist reality, it could, uh, as long as you're careful. As long as you have a system of carefully designed regulations, it could. There is no reason why it could not. But unbridled uh, market power, uh, is unlikely to 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 move towards sustainability. There are a lot of benefits in these innovations. We we have to try to to capture those uh, benefits. Uh, if but but you need regulations if you want to move towards sustainability. First, um, again, I, I'm representing the European Patent Office, so it's probably not my job to, uh, to advise on the, on the biotech directive, but just maybe I will reply to your question, of course. Uh, 
Uh, what I mean is that there is a provision, I, I, and, and I was checking, but I had no time to see in which uh, article, I think it's 13 or 14, I, I do not remember. It's really uh, uh, copy-paste of the farmer privilege that you have in the regulation uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2100 uh, st uh, stroke uh, 94. So it's the same provision which has been introduced into the directive, uh, meaning that when you, you, have, you have paid for uh, acceding uh, uh, a seed which is uh, protected by patent, you can reuse it. Uh, having said that, I, th I agree with you. I think that it has not been used uh, at many occasions. It's not something which is uh, frequently uh, raised by the, by, uh, the different uh, people uh, speaking about the directive, but there is the provision, and it's really copy-paste of what exists into the, uh, the plant variety rights uh, regulation. Thank you. He wanted to reply, but you also had something on the contracts, and those contracts are not necessarily based on a patent or a plant variety right. Huh? Those contracts have been used by seed companies without an intellectual property right title. They're more powerful. Oui, c'est l'article 11 de la directive 9844 sur les brevets. Euh, qui dit que quand il y a un brevet sur une semence, c'est non pas le droit du brevet qui s'applique, mais le droit d'obtention végétale, c'est-à-dire la Convention de l'Union pour la protection des obtentions végétales et le règlement 2194. Et que donc, même si le brevet interdit à l'agriculteur d'utiliser une partie de ses semences, sa récolte comme semence, c'est le droit d'obtention végétale qui s'applique et donc l'agriculteur peut, pour certaines espèces, hein, ce n'est pas toutes les espèces, ressemer sa récolte s'il si rémunère l'obtenteur. Alors, ça, pour l'instant, la raison principale pour laquelle il n'y a pas encore eu de conflit, elle est aussi dans le fait que toutes les variétés ou la majorité des variétés qui contiennent un brevet sont des hybrides F1 et que le droit, l'exception du fermier, le droit de l'agriculteur de ressemer une partie de sa récolte ne s'applique pas quand il s'agit d'un hybride. Mais la question qui va arriver avec le matériel hétérogène, le matériel hétérogène n'est pas couvert par un droit d'obtention végétale. Ce n'est pas possible parce qu'il est érogène. Donc là, il n'y a plus d'exception du fermier. Et il y a eu une innovation juridique avec le brevet unitaire européen, puisque le brevet unitaire européen, il prévoit une exception de l'obtenteur, une exception de recherche. Mais il a oublié de prévoir l'exception de l'agriculteur. Certainement, le lobby des agriculteurs est moins puissant euh, que le lobby des semenciers. Ça peut être une explication, mais nous, on interpelle le, le, le législateur et nous voudrions que cette exception de l'agriculteur ne s'applique pas uniquement avec le brevet unitaire européen. Aujourd'hui, il n'est pas encore opérationnel, mais qui s'applique pour tous les brevets et qui s'applique aussi euh, dans euh, la Convention euh, de l'Office européen des brevets, euh, parce que pour l'instant, les brevets, c'est là qu'ils sont. Ce n'est pas encore des brevets unitaires européens. Euh, donc là, il y, y, y a un vrai problème. J'en profite pour poser une autre question euh, qui me paraît extrêmement importante. Quand il y a eu la première proposition de la Commission sur la réglementation de semences, et donc euh, la première proposition de matériel hétérogène, nous, on a dit que ça nous intéresse beaucoup, mais on ne veut pas de brevets sur le matériel hétérogène, pour les questions, justement, pour ce que je viens de vous expliquer. Ah, on nous a dit, mais ça, c'est le droit des semences. Ce n'est pas le droit des brevets. Donc, on ne peut pas parler de brevets. Bon. Après, quand on discute sur les nouvelles techniques génomiques, on, on dit, mais il y a un problème de traçabilité. Et un problème de traçabilité des brevets. On nous dit, mais ça, ce n'est pas euh, la directive sur les inventions biotechnologiques, sur les OGM, euh, c'est la question des brevets. Et puis, quand on discute euh, 
euh, sur les brevets et qu'on pose ces questions-là, en nous disant non, mais ça, le matériel hétérogène, ce n'est pas nous, c'est la réglementation sur l'espace. Alors, le droit européen, ce n'est pas la responsabilité de vous en tant que fonctionnaire. Hein. Le droit européen, il est organisé en catégories étanches qui ne discutent pas entre elles. Euh, Aujourd'hui, vous êtes de deux, deux directions différentes. Euh, ici, ben, moi, j'en suis ravi et je sais que certains d'entre vous en sont ravis. Euh, il me semble indispensable, avant les conclusions des deux études que doit faire la Commission sur la commercialisation des semences et sur les nouvelles techniques génomiques, que cette discussion entre les diverses unités de la Commission européenne, puisque là, c'est la Commission européenne qui doit faire les études, mais aussi au niveau du Parlement européen et du Conseil, qu'ils arrêtent de nous dire que ça, c'est euh, un problème que des semences, ce n'est pas un problème de brevet euh, et réciproquement. Euh, non, euh, vous faites une étude holistique, vous avez dit tout à l'heure, euh, ben nous, au niveau du droit, on aimerait bien qu'il y ait un petit peu d'approche holistique et pas des approches comme ça, parce que sinon, euh, les droits des agriculteurs, il n'y en aura plus. Parce que moi, je vais vous rajouter les droits des agriculteurs. You wanted to reply? Yes, please. No, I was following very this, uh, following this discussion, but uh, um, again, I, I, I see that, uh, okay, there is a, a problem, but I, I see that the solution might be more on the patents, uh, on the plant variety legislation, because it is not the unitary, it's not the unitary patent uh, who deals with this thing, it's the unified patent court agreement. I mean, what is what's described here, I think, is an issue of enforcement, not, a, not a, an issue of patentability. It's an issue that once the patent is granted, what happened? And there, in the future, if there is the unified patent court, okay, there will be this court. It's not the unitary patent. It's the unified patent court that will apply Article 11, the farmer privilege of, of the directive. But then... What I understood is that the, the problem here is that there are certain categories of products, like this uh, et, um, heterogeneous is the name, that fall out of the scope of the plant's variety rights. So the whole thing, for what I have heard, is th th the thing could be solved through the legislation on plant's variety rights. I mean, to incorporate these products, and then the Article 11 will apply, the Article 11 of the Biotech Directive, So it doesn't need any change in principle. And then the unified patent court, the future unified patent court, or the current national courts, will apply this Article 11 in view of the new uh, theoretic arrangement on the plants variety rights legislation, and it, will, it would work. Uh, still, I see the issue of the traceability of uh, patents that uh, protect these products. Okay, that is a separate issue. Uh, this can be also discuss, of course. But the, the previous thing, I see it more an issue on the plants variety legislation. There's Nina. Oh, you want to? Um, <laughs> um, well, just a quick reaction to that, and it, uh, uh, I think, confirms that we need uh, uh, more uh, communication. The, the issue, of course, with heterogeneous material is that it does not conform to the definition of a variety, so it falls out of the scope of, uh, uh, of the UPOF, CPVO, uh, and the plant variety regulation. So simply these uh, rules from uh, UPOF and so on are not applicable simply to the type of material. It, it's neither, well, it's distinct, hopefully, but it's neither uniform nor stable. It's evolving material, so the Uh, definition of, of, of uh, the legal definition of variety simply does not does not apply to, to this type of material. So we we facing some some challenges in that respect. Uh, but yeah, we currently <laughs> working it, trying to work it out. Okay. So and if also if I may, because the privilege. So I, I if, can I, if I sum up. So the problem with the patent situation is not just the farmer's privilege, but also the scope of protection that is granted and the extension of the scope of protection of a patent that extends to nature or traits found in nature. And that is something 
that will not be solved by the Unified Patent Court. So I think this is, I think the discourse also needs to change in that direction. So Nina, you had a question, then we have Astrid and uh, anyone else wants to contribute? Juliette again, then Francisca again, okay. Thank you very much. And again, I would like to echo, it's been very interesting uh, speakers. Um, and, uh, and presentations today. Um, it's, it's an issue that I, I don't follow uh, from day to day, but that I, I'm uh, hugely interested in. My, my I have two questions and a comment. Uh, the first question is um, just to understand better the EU position on, um, on this digital sequence information. Um, do I understand correctly that the EU position is still that the Nagoya Protocol only applies to physical genetic resources in the sense of actual seeds, uh, actual DNA, uh, and not on digital information? Or have I completely misunderstood it? Because I think that that would be really undermining the, the Nagoya Protocol. The other question is, um, and sorry for my ignorance, but uh, what is really politically standing in the way of a reopening of the patent directive um, with the intention to no longer allow patents on seeds and, and plants and plant varieties and animals um, because I think there's a huge uh, majority in society uh, in favor of that. Um, I was there when it was voted in the first place and I was amazed by the, the lobby power already in that time by the biotech and the pharmaceutical companies that managed to push this, this through. Um, and um, in that respect, so my question is, what is standing really in the way? Does anybody in this, in this room have an answer to that? Um, and my comment is about specifically about how economic power translates into political power, which was mentioned before. Um, because I, we see it repeated. Uh, it's probably worse now, but it, it, it repeated even in this study that was, that was discussed, the study um, on... Uh, the ECJ ruling or, or how to handle the gene-edited crops is that uh, a large, large majority in the targeted stakeholder consultation are precisely the big corporations through different platforms, even through pesticide lobby platforms, which I don't understand what, what their business is in, in such a study. Um, and there's only one representation of uh, SMEs. So indeed, when the question is, is this for SMEs? Well, clearly... Uh, when, it, when you look at who is being invited to give input to this study, it's not about SMEs, it's about big corporations. And therefore, I'm really worried about uh, the quality of the study, to be honest, even though we've been given a lot of guarantees about how this would not be a mathematical exercise uh, according to how many, uh, from which sector um, uh, participate. But still, uh, why... Uh, have so many corporations give input uh, as opposed to um, seed savers, uh, organic farming associations, uh, more diverse uh, voices. That was my comment. Thank you. So quickly, maybe on DSI. I know it's not your direct. Well, the Nagoya Protocol is not my portfolio, so I was uh, talking from the context of the international treaty and the negotiations uh, to uh, revise the uh, multilateral system and the standard material transfer agreement. And in that context, the EU position is, is clear that it only applies to, to access to physical uh, genetic resources. So, uh, so I don't make any uh, statement about Nagoya. That's the colleagues in DG Environment who uh, take care of that. reply on the other <laughs> bigger <laughs> questions? No? Okay. There is a question. Yes, sure. Sorry, I just wanted to react to the comment on our stakeholder consultation because we have been very transparent about what we are trying to do and we have, of course, targeted EU-level stakeholders as, at this at this stage because we are gathering data and information. We are not, uh, you know, asking your opinion on an options or anything like that. We are gathering data and information. And uh, we identified all those stakeholders who have been in contact with us, who have expressed interest, 
but also those who would be impacted, they might not be interested, but they may be impacted. So we really try to be as inclusive as possible, and, but we are working at the EU level stakeholders. Uh, it is just the fact that in this, this uh, collection of stakeholders, there are, many, there are many breeders, farmers, retailers, also organic um, operators. When you start making mathematical calculations, you can always make it look very bad that there's not enough NGOs. We also invited NGOs who were not interested, in fact, uh, on the topic, at least not at this stage, maybe later, we don't know. It's always a challenge to make a perfect uh, targeted stakeholder consultation. I still have a great faith that we have targeted uh, good people with uh, good information, so I still have hope for our study. Thank you. And there is something on the revision of the EU biotech uh, directive you mentioned. I guess, I mean, I don't want to take over the floor from uh, other two people who are more competent on this, but I think the, um, the link between the biotech directive and the European Patent Convention is what makes it very hard to say. Because if you only amend the directive, is it actually going enough? And uh, finding solutions to all your problems while well, you're not actually touching the patent convention or national patent laws. That would be my response. Astrid, then some before. The yeah, first thank, uh, on the back. Thank you. My name is Astrid Österreicher. I represent Test Biotech here in Brussels. I have a question to Mrs. Heinema. I understand that uh, you've been asked by the Council to carry out this study. Now you're doing the targeted stakeholder consultation and you're pretty much just at the beginning of this study. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, your unit has been working on this topic for many years. Uh, I also understand that there is a paper which supposedly was uh, elaborated last year uh, which explores options on how to go about uh, this issue and there's of course this industry demand to uh, follow a differentiated approach uh, to look at the different techniques individually and look uh, whether uh, they should be treated uh, in a different way uh, especially when it comes to SDN1, SDN2 and SDN3. Some argue that the first two are mm, uh, just very tiny changes. We, of course, we would argue that they can still have a huge impact. Now, I'm just wondering whether at this stage there is any direction, any um, anything that you might already have formed yourself an opinion on, uh, whether this is something that you are considering to go that way, uh, to uh, deregulate certain techniques but not others. And um, on the targeted stakeholders um, consultation itself, I mean, we were consulted, thank you very much, um, but I also know that um, there is uh, seed savers from Germany who are working especially on the issue of keeping uh, seeds GMO free and up to now they uh, could not participate in the consultation just because of the fact that they are German and not EU level. So I do think that is a problem because they will be very much affected. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a quick reply because like I said, we the study we have really we are not prejudging at all all the outcome and i really do not know what we will do when or what we will what the commission will do it will not be our unit deciding what the commission will w want to do based on the outcome of this study on this national association that you mentioned we encourage uh, to go to check who has been consulted at the eu level and to see if there's anybody who already represent, represent this type of views and to, to maybe get, contact them if, if possible to see, to see if they can feed in their, their views on, on the questionnaire at this stage. Having said that, this is only a first stage. This is, only a, this is important, but still only a study. Eventually, if there will be any follow-up, anything, it would be a public consultation uh, as in all the fields of commission work in the in the field of better regulation so there will be there will be a plenty of time also for uh, other inputs later on so there should i would not worry too much about that
Um, yes, my point may seem to be completely out of the blue, but uh, well, I don't think it's completely out of the blue. Um, we have here talked about many issues that are on the table, like innovation, market concentration, etc. And we have here representatives of different DGs of the Commission and of the uh, um, European Patent Office. But um, I was just wondering if we, why don't we take the problem, or why do, doesn't anybody take the problem completely differently and start from, not from the state of the actual, the present negotiations, but from the state of the present emergencies. And so I'm thinking of climate, uh, the climate crisis and the biodiversity emergency. And I see there are no representatives here of the corresponding uh, uh, DGs. And so my question is, if we start from that, if we start also from the analysis, let's say, that uh, small-scale farming um, is extremely important to fight climate change, and if we take that as a starting point, what would be our vision, and how would we handle this discussion if we start from that You're taking over my conclusion from me. <laughs> that was my, <laughs> my actually, the, the concluding words. And since we're actually already out of time and the interpreters uh, have been working with us for three hours, unless someone actually uh, has more than two hours to discuss on, to, to respond to your comment, um, I guess we can call it a day. Thank the interpreters very much, all the panelists. And I would completely agree with you. I think this was extremely, an extremely technical panel. But uh, at the end of the day, we're all talking about, yes, in the a context of the rights to seeds of peasants, but also the, about the food systems and agricultural production systems we want to see in, the, um, in Europe and how we actually both adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change and how we respond to the biodiversity crisis. And so everything that's very technical and looks like a microcosm has very deep um, adverse effects. And yes, so thank you very much for coming here. Thank you to the Via Campesina and the European Economic Social Committee for hosting. And I hope you enjoyed the panel and the event. Thank you. <laughs>